Okay, our numbers of attendees in the room are steadily climbing, but in the interest of time, I will go ahead and start since nothing I have to say is uh, as crucial as what everyone else has to say. So um, good morning, afternoon, or evening, whatever time it is, wherever you are joining us from, uh, and thank you for being with us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is TJ Billard. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University and the executive director of the Center for Applied Transgender Studies in Chicago, Illinois, USA. Um, and as the executive director, it is my great honor to welcome all of you to the Applied Trans Technology Studies Symposium, which is the first of the center's free virtual public events for 2022. Um, I don't wanna delay proceedings uh, too much with formalities, but before we begin, I uh, just want to acknowledge all of the work that has gone into today um, in terms of both organizing and uh, the financing, um, and also to introduce those who are less familiar with the center's work uh, to what it is that we do here. So the Center for Applied Transgender Studies, or CATS for short, uh, is an independent nonprofit research organization dedicated to scholarship on the social, cultural, and political conditions of transgender life. Uh, launched in early 2021, uh, we consist of 40 of the world's leading transgender scholars working in six different countries on three different continents and at several of the world's premier research institutions. Um, as an organization, oh, hold on, I'm not moving through, uh, 40 people, lots of people. Uh, so as an organization, we believe that um, commitment to justice should be at the heart of academic inquiry, and we also believe that education should not only occur in classrooms, and guided by those beliefs, we facilitate and promote the empirical study of transgender issues with the ultimate aim of informing uh, public discourse and public policy in ways that improve quality of life for trans people. And part of that work is making scholarly knowledge about topics relevant to the trans community accessible through public events like the one today. Uh, CATS brings together academic rigor and activist passion to identify, analyze, and ultimately propose solutions to the greatest issues facing trans communities across the globe. And by coming together outside of the disciplinary silos that tend to define the academy, we hope to generate new insights and ideas that will better society. Uh, CATS also, uh, I should add, publishes a platinum open access journal, the Bulletin of Applied Transgender Studies, with generous support from Northwestern University Libraries um, and under the supervision of an all-star editorial board from across the globe, the bulletin publishes uh, research focused on identifiable and pragmatic social, cultural, and political issues of relevance to trans people, both at an individual and collective level. And the inaugural issue of that journal will come out uh, later this year. So uh, stay uh, attuned for that. Um, to learn more about CATS and our work, uh, you can visit us at AppliedTransStudies.org or follow us on Twitter at TransStudies. Uh, and to learn more about the bulletin or to submit your own research, you can visit bulletin.AppliedTransStudies.org. Uh, so now that you know a little bit more about the organization hosting the event, uh, it's only right that I acknowledge the individuals within CATS and the organizations outside of it who have made today possible. Um, first, I want to extend my warmest thanks to CAT senior fellows, Oliver Hameson, Alex Hanna, and Aaron Lauren Hoffman for uh, organizing today's symposium from inception to execution. So a silent round of applause uh, for all of them. Uh, and thanks also to our various co-sponsors um, who provided crucial funding for today's events. Uh, so I'll go in alphabetical order uh, based on institution. Uh, so our sincerest thanks to the Labor Tech Research Network who have sponsored today's keynote um, at Northwestern University, uh, the gender, uh, the Institute for Sexual and Gender Minority Health and Wellbeing, the Gender and Sexuality Studies Program, uh, the PhD in Technology and Social Behavior, and the Sexualities Project at Northwestern, and at the University of Michigan, the Digital Studies Institute, the Institute for Research on Women and Gender, and the School of Information. Uh, thank you to all of these co-sponsors. Um, finally, before I hand things off, uh, I want to lay out the schedule for today's events. Um, we'll begin with a few remarks by Anna Lauren Hoffman before moving into our first session, uh, moderated by Alex Hanna, Applied Trans Studies Meets Critical Data Studies from uh, 12, 15 to 1 30 central time. Uh, we'll then take a 15 minute break until we return for our keynote by Cass Adair, 
uh, from 1.45 to 2.45. And then finally, we will round out the day with our second session moderated by Oliver Hainson, Applied Trans Studies Meets Digital Studies uh, from 2.45 to 4. Um, and throughout these events, please feel free to tweet along using the hashtag Applied Trans Tech. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand over to Anna Lauren Hoffman. Hi, thanks, TJ. Um, I'm I'm really excited to be here. I, I'm Anna Lauren Hoffman. Uh, I'm uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of Washington Information School, uh, and I'm joining all of you from uh, from the. Seattle, uh, which sits on the land that is the traditional and ongoing home of the Coast Salish people and all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. As I was thinking about how to open an event like this, um, an event like this that is also the first symposium for the Center for Applied uh, Trans Studies, which no pressure, right, or, or anything. Um, I sought refuge and inspiration as I've often done since it was published in, uh, in Hill Malatino's uh, lovely uh, little book, Trans Care. I'm sure many of you are familiar. And so I wanna start uh, with, a, with an extended excerpt from that text that I think is gonna capture um, what's at stake and, and, and what we'll be, be uh, grappling with today. Malatino writes, we come to gender as supplicants, all of us. And many of us fail the litmus test of decency because our modes of gender presentation are too vulgar, too loose, too gender fucked. And we fail to enact and achieve a certain verisimilitude of normative white maleness or femaleness. Failing this litmus, litmus test means we are repeatedly refused, turned away in moments of our imploring recognition. We all recognize gender as a morally loaded, laborious process. It is work but we often labor under conditions we don't choose, conditions that many of us actively want to destroy. But we also understand intimately that the concept of autonomy that underwrites romantic myths of the insurrectionary subject can't hold. Gender recognition is sustained by a web of forces that we don't control. Though we exert agency in determining our forms of life and flesh, that agency is always only one part of a much broader assembly into which our flesh and its possibilities are grafted." End quote. Reflecting on this passage, it struck me that maybe maybe I, there isn't that much pressure <laughs> uh, to open this because uh, maybe in some ways the topic of a, of a quote sort of applied trans technology studies is the perfect for a symposium for cats. If what an applied trans studies strives to be is not uh, is not some positivistic competitor to trans studies that is as it has uh, emerged and unfolded in the humanities but rather a complement, a space where further critical, technical, and social scientific methods can find recognition as, uh, as we work to address the material and political exigencies of trans life, then, quote, technology is undoubtedly an appropriate place to begin. In particular, the digital, informational, and data technologies at the center of this event are, you might say, where the theoretical rubber hits the practical road. As the infamous Latourian phrase goes, technology is society made durable. And digital platforms, databases, and algorithmically mediated systems all rely on and encode either explicitly or implicitly abstract ideals of subjectivity and agency that we often think of as the stuff of theory, but that are also in a practical day-to-day -day sense, the things we marshal to use or resist, to build or break, or to, uh, and, and, and to ultimately endure. Uh, struggling with and against the ways such systems enact the morally loaded and laborious social processes of gender and recognition. And as trans scholars and scholars invested in trans life and livelihoods, we no doubt have a lot to say about those processes, but you wouldn't always know it from looking at dominant research literatures or design efforts in, in areas like critical technology studies, critical data studies, and uh, critical platform studies and beyond. I'm often struck, for example, by our absence in broader, and we might say trendy, and we can definitely say well-funded discussions of algorithmic manipulation. These discussions are driven by fears or anxieties or, or worse, moral panics over computers hijacking our thoughts and emotions, subtly manipulating people into buying things we don't need or 
buying into fascistic and genocidal ideologies as if people have ever needed a lot of help with that. Absent from these dominant moral and political debate, uh, but at the core of many of these discussions is the assumption of a subject who identifies seamlessly within the system and so can be enrolled and hijacked in that way. A seamless identification available only to certain normative subjects. Absent from these dominant moral or po and political debates about our technologically mediated futures are those of us who daily struggle for identification and recognition in order to exist and communicate safely online. Similar absences mark other literatures. For example, <laughs> looking at many of the dominant discussions of surveillance, AI, and digital and biometric technologies, you might be forgiven if you thought that trans people are only are mystical creatures who only appear in airport security checkpoints. But then again, maybe there's something to that. We might recall another mystical creature, that of Frankenstein's monster, that depending on your view, either proudly inaugurates or problematically haunts trans studies, applied or otherwise. And in recalling that monster, we might recognize that and admit that today's equivalent to Dr. Frankenstein's slab is less the plastic surgeon's operating table and more the millimeter wave scanner, a site and system where state fantasy, techno-scientific rationality, and a theatrical display of security combined to literally animate us, like actually as like little cartoon outlines on a screen, rendering us in that moment both trans and a problem to be dealt with. But maybe I'm getting carried away. Maybe the force of an applied trans technology studies comes to us in the ability to say, who cares? Material assemblage or discursive achievement, it's not gonna help me catch my fucking flight faster. And on that note, we need to get to some fucking panels. So let me introduce uh, uh, further my, uh, my co-organizers for today, uh, two folks that I have, I'm, I'm deeply grateful for and, uh, uh, and, and that I've had the distinct pleasure of knowing and, and working with in the past. Um, first, uh, is, uh, I want to recognize Alex Hanna, uh, a sociologist and senior research scientist working at the Ethical AI team uh, at Google. Her research centers on origins of the training data, which form the informational infrastructure of AI and algorithmic fairness frameworks, and the way these data sets exacerbate racial, gender, and class inequality. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to exist and do the work that I do if, if Alex didn't also exist and do the work that she does. And I'm, I'm so grateful. And then I gotta, I gotta recognize Oliver who, who frankly was, was the, this event wouldn't be possible without, Oliver was the instigator, uh, brought this idea to, to Alex and I and, and uh, was the person who really gave us, uh, who pushed the planning along when uh, when it needed the push, and so uh, uh, and so uh, Oliver Hamson is an assistant professor at the University of Michigan School of Information, a senior fellow here at Katz, and a recipient of a National Science Foundation Career Award. He conducts social computing research focused on envisioning and designing trans technologies, uh, social media content moderation, and marginalized popula populations, and changing identities on social media during life transitions. Uh, I've known Oliver for quite some time, and uh, I'm just I'm thrilled to be be working on this uh, event with you today. Uh, and of course, thanks to TJ, uh, for, for without whom we, we like literally wouldn't be here, like the Zoom wouldn't have gotten set up, right? Like, like we, it just wouldn't happen. Uh, and so, uh, so, so all the love and, 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 and big show to TJ. Um, and on that note, I'm gonna turn it over to Alex, who's gonna take us into the first panel today on critical data studies meets applied trans studies. Thank you so much, Anna, for that brilliant introduction. Um, Anna is someone who gives voice to things in a much more, such an eloquent and forceful way, in ways that I just truly, I, I, I'm just like, what would Anna say here? <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm just a meme that's kind of incoherent yelling um uh <laughs> comparatively um i'm so excited and i've been so excited and looking forward to this panel today um this panel and and what we're focusing on today is um this initial panel at applied trans studies meets critical data studies um the format of this panel is going to be as follows 
our panelists are going to present um, for five-ish minutes. I'm going to pose some questions to them and then invite questions from the audience. So without further ado, what I'm planning to do is to um, say who's on the panel and then provide larger bios before they present. On the panel today, uh, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Avery Everhart, um, Jen Ajax Geese King, Mar Hicks, Morgan Klaus Showerman, and Nikki Stevens. First up, we have Avery Everhart. Avery Everhart is a co-founder, distinguished fellow, and the current director of finance for the Center for Applied Transgender Studies. She works broadly at the intersection of information, social and spatial sciences, with an emphasis on transgender and gender diverse communities and access to health care. Avery is in her final year of the Population Health in Place PhD program at the University of Southern California. And I'll hand it to you, Avery. Thank you, Alex. Um, I'm going to share some slides uh, in the hopes that this will make things a little bit simpler uh, to be able to understand some of my ongoing work. Um, are you all able to see these? Sorry, I have to ask. I've got a three monitor set up, so <laughs> I always choose the wrong one. Um, so thank you again. Uh, to TJ and to Alex and Anna and Oliver for organizing. Um, and I'm really excited to be a part of this. Um, and I just wanna take my quick little five minutes, maybe I can do it in less than that, uh, to talk about some of my ongoing uh, data specific work uh, so that I can sort of ground you in where I'm coming from when I am critical of data uh, and critical of data science that it's also coming from a deep investment in wanting to try to use data to solve issues that trans communities face. So uh, in one area, I work in health informatics uh, especially for trans and gender diverse patients at the clinic level. Uh, and this really fantastic project that was led by Claire Kronk, who's uh, a new fellow joining us at CATS, um, is featured in the Journal of American Medical Informatics Association. And it was a collaboration with about 17 or 18 of us who are all trans informaticists, clinicians, researchers of various kinds, and many of whom are CATS fellows. Um, and I believe it's still freely available currently because it was chosen as the editor's choice for a special issue in Jamia. Uh, and the hope is that it will be able to impact both the clinic level in terms of how data related to trans people's identities are collected and stored in electronic medical records, but also for research purposes and translation across systems. Uh, and hopefully if it interests you, you'll be able to give it a read. Uh, but that's one arena I've been working in. And in another, especially in collaboration with Dr. L. Lett, who's also a fellow at CATS. I've been working on trans population health data, and we have this piece in Annals of Epidemiology that recently came out uh, that really looks at two of the major sources for population level trans health information, uh, specifically the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, which if you're unfamiliar, it's that source uh, from which we get this supposed estimate that trans people are 0.6% of the American population. So we situate uh, how the data has been used for which purposes and situated alongside the United States Transgender Survey from 2015 and really interrogate the implications of relying on these two data sets in the scientific literature about transgender life and especially trans health given some concerns about a lack of geographic and ethno-racial representation in these population level samples. In my own current research, aka my dissertation, I've been turning to spatial demography to be able to think about both on the descriptive level, why uh, do we get such different population estimates in terms of how many trans people there are or what percentage of the population identifies as trans based on your data source, uh, but also looking at how we can possibly improve population level estimates. And this again relies on the birth this data, but compares to some more recent data that's being conducted by the census. Uh, and it's really been in response to the COVID-19 pandemic and trying to understand its impact on households in the US. But interestingly, in its most recent wave, it introduced some sexual orientation and gender identity protocols. And they consulted with folks who are involved with the NASM tax 
task force on SOGI data. Uh, so it's got a much different protocol. And my work currently is comparing both the sampling methods as a random digit dialing versus an internet-based survey, as well as their differing gender identity protocols. Uh, and I'd be happy to talk about this if there's any interest in it, but I could talk all day about my nerdy little special interest about <laughs> differing protocols for capturing trans data. And then lastly, uh, I released the first version of a gender affirming hormone therapy provider database. And it's a spatial database, really compact in GeoJSON form. And I drew from community facing re resources and used a qualitative and sort of snowballing approach to be able to verify which providers and facilities actually offer gender affirming hormone therapy. And then mapped that also to compare its spread in terms of geographic availability of care relative to what we know if we know anything about trans populations and where trans folks live or maybe hoping to access care. Um, and I'm looking to expand this after the dissertation to create a more user-facing resource and also expand it for better research by including other data on accessibility. So it isn't just about distance you'd have to travel to care, but also about the consent model that they use. Does it inform consent or do they require a mental health clinician referral? Do they use a sliding scale fee model or is it flat fee for services, et cetera? And that QR code, if you're interested, will take you directly to the GitHub where it's available already, especially if you're uh, interested in using it for research. But I wanted to just introduce these projects really quickly, many of which are collaborative, uh, just again to ground you and sort of where I'm coming from at this intersection of geographic information science and population health. Uh, so that I can say, like, <laughs> I do work on this stuff, but I'm also going to be extremely critical of the existing data and what we think we know about trans populations. And I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ivory. That was so much in presenting <laughs> so many projects. I'm really excited to talk about all of them. Um, I've got like 18 questions in my head. <laughs> um, introducing next, Jen Jack East King. Um, Jack is a cultural and economic geographer engaged in research on co-productions of space and identity in digital and material environments. He is assistant professor of geography at the University of Kentucky, where he teaches courses on digital feminist and queer geographies and critical cartography and mapping. Jack's book, A Queer New York Geographies of Lesbians, Dykes, and Queers, is the first lesbian historical geography of New York City. Their mixed ethnographic archival approach resulted in his rethinking the construction of, quote, data to produce a space for collaborative public queer history, including interactive maps of over 2,300 lesbian queer places spanning from 1983 to 2008. I'll hand it over to you, Jack. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for having me here. I, I think all of you are so wonderfully cool and I was ecstatic to be part of this. So this is a super honor in my life. So I'm also gonna uh, share a couple slides um, and uh, you should be seeing this little thing. Um, uh, shout out also to Cats for their incredible font choice. I just think it's just truly stunning and thank you for that. So um, I have been long thinking about data viz uh, as uh, working with uh, lesbian queer people is visualizing the supposedly invisible. Um, and now I'm thinking about trans data as visualizing the hypervisible um, and also the invisible. Um, and uh, I'm going to make Hill blush some more and, and start by quoting trans care because my favorite quote uh, is something that's quotes that really drive me are like anonymous name, but not, but re not represented, inhaled in the complexity of my need to be seen and unseen simultaneously, to be comforted and also left alone, to for once feel held and witness, witness within a public space without being made subject of other people's witness of me. And I think it's also balanced by this beautiful quote, sometimes being trans feels like wanting to resist and evade spectacularized visibility with every fiber of your being. Sometimes it feels like just wanting to be seen in all your banality, sleepily chomping on a banana while wearing sweatpants. Um, I definitely tra think trans Tumblr is a place where a lot of people have uh, been chomping on a banana wearing sweatpants. Um, and I started researching that um, in 2014 um, and Hill's uh, quotes really speak to this kind of uh, tension about um, how are we regarded and seen. And so um, I got really into data visualizations as a geographer, someone with a big background um, in GIS, and I started grabbing uh, Tumblr data 
um, so many different hashtags. Um, and this is kind of a snapshot of, of what the, the data looks like. And so I'm going to briefly show you um, just some instances, some data viz of what a year of trans Tumblr data looks like and some things that I've been um, thinking about. Um, so one is just like obviously starting with a really easy text analysis and getting to see this kind of sense of self-development. Um, uh, this is a, a year's worth from 15 to 16. Um, and of course, tons about embodiment. These are the, the F to M hashtags. Of course, I started with F to M and M to F when people use them a long time ago. So please don't hate on me. I, I, I caught up. I don't use that for myself anymore either, obviously. Um, and then going into um, uh, the, those are the actual posts and these are the hashtags and seeing the differences between them um, and thinking a lot about like how AI and machine learning can uh, really shape this data. I work with uh, my cishet best friend uh, who's a Galilean, uh, researches Galileo um, and actually is driven by wanting to work on issues of social justice um, and is a brilliant text analysis uh, um, guru uh, when it comes to R. Um, and then I work on more on the mapping. But when we got the data and I was very excited about it and started um, <clears throat> back in the day, I was told actually that my idea for a participatory action research project, a youth participatory action research project, uh, was not possible to do uh, uh, because, and I felt somewhat old starting this project a decade ago in my mid thirties that I wouldn't actually be knowing what the cool, knowing what the cool kids were doing on Tumblr, uh, mostly driven by youth. Uh, but I was told I was now allowed to talk to people or tell them that I was um, uh, actually downloading their data, their, very, their supposedly very public data, um, this privacy that they were having in public because it would constitute an interaction. Um, and I had mentioned that I had noticed uh, back in 2000, uh, you know, around from 2010, 2011, about every 50 to 100 posts that I saw was a suicide note. And then other people would swarm in and help one another. Um, and I was wondering very much about these networks and worlds. So kind of losing this ethnographic uh, interview uh, insight perspective from the people actually using the data uh, has been really hard. And it's been something I've been waiting to do over time. Uh, and I didn't want to lose sight of that because the way that I'm structuring the data and I and when I work uh, with my colleague Crystal asking her about what she's excited about, um, always she's deferring to me, but I think that there's something um, to think about to think wider uh, and more widely um, about the, the patterns that we're seeing um, that come um, from within, from our own experience, from trans studies and what we're reading. Um, this is a, just a brief snapshot of what's happening in terms of social networks on there that got me really excited. Uh, so if you don't really know how to read these sorts of graphs, every dot is a person and every like is a very tiny line. And you'll see these kind of dots floating at the edge and those are singletons as they're called, which means there's some people out there on the on their own looking in, but for most people, most part, everyone's connected in that like big bang image in the middle, which is really beautiful and moving. And it's about an average of five degrees separation on Tumblr. And that actually holds um, almost uh, for a decade now, uh, which is incredible, um, the connectivity uh, and the kind of world creation that happens there. Um, and this is something that uh, I'm excited to look at through the data, but um, 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 and, and thinking about um, how we can use AI to think about different patterns in the data, but we're starting really slowly with things I'm excited about. Um, so something I noticed uh, uh, looking online is there's a conversation um, from someone about uh, looking for a binder, which is purple or binding, which is green. Evidently people know how to bind. Uh, this is uh, trans mass people, how to bind. They don't really need a lot of tips on that with their with starting off with an East bandage and then what kind of binder do they buy? And then going into top surgery. Um, and one, you could think about this as a kind of uh, before and after temporality, but actually some people just show up about and talk about one or the other, but there's very little interaction in between. Um, and then taking this kind of research and uh, really thinking about what uh, big data can do, especially for trans studies, looking at trans studies quarterly, um, binder, binding, packing, anything that is a period, uh, any kind of um, uh, body modifications, uh, being with your body that uh, is not really uh, driven by hormones or surgeries doesn't very much appear in trans studies quarterly. I think there's one mention of a packer or packing, three mentions of binders or binding as an example um, in the entire oeuvre. Um, and so how do we uh, open up these ways of like what FTSQ is defining a lot of trans studies? How do we um, think about that differently. And Crystal and I are, are writing that paper. 
Um, so ending with another quote and letting you see some of the, the trans tumblr frequency table, because people always get really interested and exciting about these kind of terms. Um, there's a lot of labeling that goes on uh, by trans youth, um, but what are their limitations too about the worlds they have access to and what they get from the media and how are they reproducing that in this data and how do we intervene in that is something I'm really concerned about. Um, and, and Cameron's quote that transness at a minimum is the assistance of the capacity for once unimaginable change. Uh, and so it's something that really drives me to think about that. Um, and the questions I sit with is how transness especially can inspire new thinking about data viz and the, and the benefits of AI and machine learning that I'm sitting with a lot to inform these visualizations. So thanks, and I look forward to chatting with you all. Thank you, Jack. What an amazing provocation, questions to leave us with. What can we do with data viz and where are the limits of AI? And ML, I have many, many thoughts. <laughs> Next, Mar Hicks. Um, Mar is an author, historian, and professor doing research on the history of computing, labor, technology, and queer science and technology studies. Their research focuses on how gender and sexuality bring hidden technological dynamics to light and how the experiences of women and LGBTQIA people change the core narratives of the history of computing in unexpected ways. Hicks's multiple award-winning book, Programmed Inequality, which is fantastic, looks at how the British lost their early lead in computing by discarding women computer workers and what this cautionary tale tells us about current issues in high tech. Their new work looks at resistance and queerness in the history of technology. Hicks is also co-editor editor of the book, Your Computer is on Fire, a volume of essays about how we can begin to fix our broken high-tech infrastructures. Handing it over to, to Mar. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you to um, all of you for making this space available. I'm going to share some slides. And hopefully you can all see my slides at this point. All right, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the long history of transphobic algorithmic bias, which is something that I'm looking at in my new book that I'm tentatively titling Digital Resistance. And as Alex mentioned, it's a history of technology that looks at how marginalized groups of users oftentimes you know, cannot escape these top-down hegemonic technologies um, we have to use them, we have to function within these systems. So what are the methods for resisting and what are the histories of resistance that we can draw upon? Um, one of the parts um, of that book that really excites me is the uh, chapter that I'm doing on uh, the earlier history of transphobic algorithmic bias, because I think a lot of the time we are presented with certain problems as new problems, or there is this um, perception on the part of maybe uh, mainstream um, journalists, tech journalists, or even people who are practitioners uh, that these problems are somehow new, when in fact they've been around for a very long time, uh, literally since the very beginning stages of electronic computing. And when I say they've been around, I don't mean in just sort of a passive uh, sense in a, oh, well, we forgot to account for the existence of trans people sense. I mean, in a quite intentional form. And so I'll talk about that example in just a second. So this um, is a, represent a representation of the sort of computer systems that I'm talking about. They're you know, still really pretty early on in the mainframe era. And that's when um, we start to see things appear in um, data sets that historians use, things like um, government records that started to imply to me that there was a bigger story here about um, trans people and how they were getting programmed into electronic computers. And one of the things that was both interesting and um, kind of exciting and also incredibly frustrating for me while I was trying to do this research was that I stumbled into um, these files while I was doing the re research for my first book, Programmed Inequality, but the files weren't open and there was no um, 
timeline on when they were going to be opened, or if there was, it was something like, you know, 50 years in the future. So I started FOIAing these, um, these files from the UK government archives and made sort of, I think, a nuisance of myself because they were saying, oh, you're, you know, you're requesting too many files. And it actually took years for all of the requests to be processed and ultimately for some of the files to be released, oftentimes in redacted forms. And when I saw what was in these files, I was both really grateful, but also somewhat aghast because for one thing, there was a lot of very personal information in these files. And these files were at the time restricted to only a very high level sort of um, almost, they weren't secret, but only certain people within the government could see them, very high level civil servants. Here's an example of one of them. And basically what they talked about was the way that trans people would be programmed into this computer here, this new electronic system that was being installed to take over from the earlier electromechanic systems that um, simply couldn't cope with all of the new data needs of the British welfare state after World War II. There were just too many calculations um, to be done. They needed to be done more quickly. And at this juncture, there were many trans people with the government and had been for many years writing to the Ministry of Pensions and National Insurance saying, I want to correct the gender on my records and I want to correct the gender on my um, national secure, uh, my national insurance card in particular, because that could cause a lot of problems for people. It was, it's kind of akin to a social security card, something you might have to show to, um, you know, get legal employment or to draw benefits. And the government is talking about in these files, well, how do we handle these people and their requests? And essentially what they end up saying in a nutshell is that they will fix the numbers when they put folks into the computer, but they will not fix the gender. And they say that the reason they're doing this is because the computer doesn't need to see gender. It only needs to get the numbers right. But then privately on a sort of more um, a more secret level in some of these files, they're saying that actually they don't want to program trans people into the new system as their correct gender, because if they do that, that will be giving them tacit sanction. And they do not want to do that to a group whom they, um, in some cases, you know, they're still referring to them <clears throat> as, um, as perverts. And so this is clearly a case in which computer um, technology is being used as a cover for um, political will that's being expressed through the system. And so they intentionally program the system to literally throw an error code when it hits the, um, the account of somebody who is, as they uh, say at the time, a quote unquote known transsexual. And that person's account gets kicked out of the automated processing chain and then is dealt with manually. And if you wanna learn more about that and why that is um, a, a problem and why it was done that way and why this is, I, I would say, as far as I know, it's the earliest example of transphobic algorithm bias I've been able to find in an electronic computing system. Uh, you can look at this article that I published on it in the IEEE Annals of the History of Computing. And I will try to drop the link in the chat for that if I remember to. Um, the other thing is that there are so many um, parallels, or at least I think this can be a useful history to so many of the things that we're dealing with right now. Um, you know, in 2019, there was a huge brouhaha at Google where uh, Google set up its own internal AI ethics board uh, basically with no input from anybody but Google management. And they had somebody on it who was quite transphobic and xenophobic and Google um, workers spoke out against that. And what ended up happening was within about a week, uh, Google just decided to just dissolve the ethics board instead of taking the note, um, which I think shows how often um, this language of, oh, we're trying to fix things is not necessarily um, 
some people mean it and some people within industry, especially at higher levels of industry, do not. I'm seeing Alex saying in the chat, that was a fun week. I can only imagine. Um, and then, of course, the issue that we're running up against now with systems that are purporting to automatically identify people by um, gender, for instance, and doing so in a way that completely, you know, mistakes or transposes um, automatic recognition with just basically um, forcing a, an, an identity on somebody based on how a computer um, vision system says they, they look. Um, I really love Dr. Uh, Anna Laura Hoffman's um, mention in her introductory remarks where uh, she said, seamless identification is accessible only to certain normative subjects. And I'm not going to say too much more because I think I'm out of time, but I'll just end by saying, you know, I think it's useful, and of course I have this bias because I'm a historian, but I think it's useful for us to all think about and talk about the ways in which these are not new problems, because it's oftentimes useful for people who don't have much stake in fixing these problems to pretend that they are new problems. Um, when we have histories of resistance, we can counter these very facile narratives of technological revolution that want us to pretend that somehow things inexorably change for the better over time. And um, we can start to see how people in the past, in fact, try to survive forms of digital oppression that I think now are, if nothing else, um, on more people's minds and in fact may be intensifying more and more. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mar, for that incredible historical sweep identifying, yes, these are not new problems. And um, to also quote another <laughs> quote from Anna, um, covering and weaponizing the language of inclusion uh, as this um, techno-rationalist promise to always do better. I'm not getting that quote exactly right, but that's from... Um, um, uh, um, uh, um, terms of in, um, inclusion, uh, a fantastic paper. Um, moving now to Morgan Klaus Schauerman. Morgan is a PhD student of information science at University of Cal uh, not California, Colorado Boulder, and a 2021 MSR, Microsoft Research Research Fellow. His research focuses on the intersection of technical infrastructure and marginalized identities. In particular, he examines how gender and race characteristics are embedded into algorithmic infrastructures and how those permeations influence the entire system. His recent work explores how gender and race classification and computer vision technologies excludes and endangers at-risk individuals. Pass it over to Morgan. Great, so I'm gonna share my, I only have a single slide and now I'm kind of wishing I had like slides for all of my projects that are on here. Um, but yes, thank you so much, Alex, for the introduction. And also um, thank you to the organizers of this. This has been really fascinating and I'm so excited to see everyone else's work in this area. Um, so a little bit more about me and my work, uh, it is, Primarily, I want to, to kind of highlight this arc of what I've been looking at, which is uh, examinations of gender in computer vision technology specifically. So I know that this audience is kind of a, a broad audience and people have specialties in different areas. So at a really high level, computer vision is um, an application of machine learning, which is often touted as AI or artificial intelligence. And um, it basically people feed uh, these algorithms a bunch of image or visual data and get predictions based on what they want to predict. Um, so this might be things like gender recognition that Mar was talking about, um, or it might be other things like facial recognition, which a lot of people are super familiar with. Um, so I've been exploring this and its relation to gender since um, my master's work um, at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, so some of my early work, I actually, did some interviews with trans um, uh, and non-binary identifying people and how they felt about the 
perception, their perception of this type of technology. If an algorithm is reading your gender visually, um, and probably not very uh, surprising to people at this uh, symposium is that people were very concerned by this. Um, they didn't care whether it was used for touted security purposes, whether it was used for advertising. Uh, people were generally disagreed with this um, technology, but I did also find some really interesting um, tidbits from people who thought, oh, this technology could also be used in ways that are really affirming. So that, that was kind of interesting and something I think would be worth exploring further. Um, and also that people felt that, some people felt that it was worse uh, than when you're interacting with human beings and they're misgendering you versus uh, computers. And some thought that computers were worse and some thought they were the same. So these were really interesting insights of, of how um, trans people broadly interpret this technology. And um, I think it's easy um, as academics to kind of assume what those, those interpretations might be. And so I thought that was a really interesting way to get started on this work. Um, and then I've also looked at a lot of the infrastructures of these technologies. So um, I did an analysis of uh, commercially available systems that offer gender in their uh, computer vision models. So these models are generally available to any, uh, any person who wants to purchase them. Um, so you can purchase kind of like a cloud package and then build out an app or a website um, using these models. Um, and so I was really inspired by uh, prior work um, on gender shades by Jubal Longini and Timnit Gebru. So I don't know if people are familiar with that work, but they did an audit on um, how how gender is classified by race. So they found that uh, darker skinned women tend to be misclassified more. And so I also wanted to look at how trans people tend to be classified by these systems um, and was kind of unsurprised to find that generally trans people are uh, misclassified much more often than their cisgender peers. And beyond that, uh, gender permeates these systems further than just gender classification. So. A lot of these systems also offer object labeling and kind of what is supposed to give, give its users uh, a more contextual knowledge about the image for things like advertising. Um, and so gender actually permeated all of this. So a lot of um, labels used are associated with things like femininity in particular, where masculinity is kind of viewed as this neutral um, thing that doesn't need to be labeled in the same way. Um, and then more recent work, uh, I've been looking at the larger values of these systems. So um, in terms of analyzing where gender labels, as well as other labels, like racial labels come from um, in these systems, uh, I did some analysis of computer vision data sets. So the data that is used to train uh, the models. And a lot of this is actually academic. Um, a lot of computer vision is fueled by academic uh, academics who are, who are doing this research. And so industry plays a large part in this, but also it's interesting to, to also implicate academia in this. And so a lot of the academics who are building out these large scale data sets, including data sets that are extremely famous and used by industry like ImageNet, um, are not engaging with any socio-historical nature of things like gender, race, um, any other identity labels that they're using, and they're not even defining or justifying their use um, or, or telling users where those definitions are coming from. Um, and then also in, in kind of some more critical work that I did with Alex um, and also Madeline Pape, uh, we looked at how, I saw people talking about this in the chat, how gender in technology is much older than com computational technologies themselves. Um, so we analyzed how this a genealogy of gendering, particularly along racial lines with classifying um, people through colonialist practices, as well as the definition of sex and gender and how we've treated intersex people and intervened and measured people's bodies so that they can be corrected how this actually forms a pipeline into computational tools like gender recognition technologies and how those are just kind of new instantiations of these technologies. Um, 
and we engage with things like the TSA and airports where, um, as Anna said, we just seem to appear and only exist in those in these cases where we are seen as uh, security threats. Um, similarly, if some people are familiar with uh, the platform Giggle, this is kind of viewing, for example, trans women as a threat to women's online spaces and utilizing technologies uh, to bar people from those spaces. Um, so that's kind of been all of my prior work. Um, and now in my dissertation, I'm actually looking at how people in industry are making decisions about these things. So if a, an engineer is like, I need to build out gender in my computer vision model. Um, why are they doing that? What do they think that is useful for? How are they justifying that? And how are they defining their schemas of gender? Um, and so that's, that's kind of my current and ongoing work. And I'm also happy to talk about some of the consulting work that I've done in this area with tech companies and some of the interesting blockades or pivots or arguments that I've seen um, that people make for these technologies. Um, so yeah, that's that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Morgan. And yeah, we can definitely talk chat a lot about the vicissitudes of computer vision data sets, which are um, awful to say the least. Lastly, rounding out the panel is Nikki Stevens. Nikki is a PhD candidate at Arizona State University and a researcher at Dartmouth College. Their research centers the data model as an important location to examine the ways that white supremacy and cisgender normativity are reproduced within software systems. Prior to returning to graduate school, they were a software engineer, technical architect, and an award-winning open source contributor. Pass it to you, Nikki. Um, thanks, Alex. I'm so excited to be here with all of you. Um, this is such a lovely way to end a long week um, and to interrupt a, a long pandemic winter. Um, so like Alex mentioned, my work focuses on the data model. And one of the things that I'm thinking about um, and that I learned a lot from my long career as a software engineer is that the engineers that I know and worked with wanted ways to do better. And confronted with problems of algorithmic bias, algorithms, as we know from scholarship and life can be so inscrutable and big data data sets can be so big, right? And it's like, how can one engineer or a small team of engineers really make interventions into these like monolithic concepts? Um, which I think led me to my focus on the data model. And for those of you not familiar, a data model is the stuff that happens before the database exists, before the algorithms exist. It happens when you're sitting around the table saying, we need to track riders and drivers and where they go. How do we make those connections? How do we do that design? Um, so the data model is not just the design of the database, but it's a series of like epistemological and ontological commitments, a series of knowledge commitments on how the world looks within our software system. So what my research does is it focuses on how those commitments that we make during this design phase reinforce systems of power. And for me, that's white supremacy and cisgender normativity. How do our data models reinforce these things that we as trans people know are embedded in software and that tech companies know are embedded and, and seem sort of like flailing to fix if they do wanna fix it. And I think there's a couple of like really important things um, when we're thinking about data models and that my work you know, tries to highlight. And one is that data models structure algorithmic opportunities. And so when we're thinking about algorithmic bias, the algorithm can't perform in a certain way without the data model shaping those opportunities. So um, when we're talking about data bias, data set bias, the data set cannot take that shape until the data model has, you know, the data model gives you the square holes into which you can put those square pegs and it gives you the round holes. So rather than holding up square pegs and saying, this is fucked, we can look instead at the shape of the data model and say, well, we've actually created environments that facilitate this data bias or this algorithmic bias. And then for me, the third, like most important thing about data models is that they're intervenable. They're inherently intervenable and they're inherently knowable objects. Um, so as part of my work, I take existing surveillance devices and I reverse engineer them to infer the data models underneath them. So I take, um, I specifically work with sexual surveillance devices, so internet connected dildos, because they're fun to talk about um, and fun to think about, but also really hackable. 
So I can go in and I can look at the data model that shapes, um, I use the Levens system, um, and I can reverse engineer those data models and say, look at all these assumptions that these developers were making about sex, about gender, about connection. And as a result, what is happening with our software. Um, so that's what my work does. I don't have a slide, but I do wanna share with you this one meme because I think memes are great and important. Um, can you all see my meme? So I'm gonna read this out loud for access reasons. Um, so the first, it's a Tumblr conversation <laughs> as a reference to Jack's work. Uh, the first person posts, change your name and gender at least twice a year for security reasons, uh, which is amazing. And then the second person, use a gender manager so I don't have to memorize what gender I'm currently using for which accounts. The final comment, says, quote, man and quote, woman are commonly used genders. To make yourself more secure, try to come up with a unique gender that only you know. Um, and I love this meme for a zillion reasons, but one is that I feel like it so skillfully ties together the things that we as trans people know about gender, that they're personally known, that they're contextual, that they're temporal, that they're fluid, that they change, that they have labels that maybe are commonly known, maybe are not, right? And it seamlessly puts it into a technological context and ties it to these things that we consider to be trivial to change, like our passwords, right? And so this for me is like the perfect example of thinking about tech through a gender lens, thinking about gender through a tech lens. Um, and I'd be happy to talk about anything I talked about or just this meme during the Q&A. So thank you. Thank you, Nikki. This meme is fantastic. And oh my gosh, the chat is like, really going wild for dildo onyx and like like hell yes please um okay 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 this is so good all right we have 15 minutes left so <laughs> oh no we have a third we have 30 minutes okay uh <laughs> so all right questions um i have questions and these are questions so i'm going to kind of start and i'm going to try to aim these more in kind of lumpy ways. So addressing um, two or more people kind of thinking about this. So um, I wanna start with kind of question oriented towards Avery and Jack and kind of thinking about um, data because the orientation of what you're presenting is sort of data on trans life and mapping of data. So kind of in a way in thinking like how can data on trans life be used as a means of harm reduction and how, and what examples do you have for us of thinking beyond existing data structures for capture classification and how can we use that kind of presentation styles? So let's start in the same order, go with Avery and then go to Jack. Sure, uh, yeah, this is fantastic also, um, because. I've met most of y'all, but not everybody. And I'm familiar with all of your work, but getting to hear y'all talk about it has been really exciting. So I'm like flattered to be a part of the conversation. Um, yeah, in terms of data as harm reduction, I use that framework a lot in my own work um, because there's really a spectrum of belief about data in trans communities that you kind of have some on one hand that think any attempt at data collection or data generation is inherently going to be about violence, about oppression, or about surveillance, and that it can never do any good. And then on the other hand, you have some people who think that you can machine learn and artificial intelligence your way out of any problem that trans people face. Uh, and I think this panel is especially interesting because none of us are on either of those extremes, I don't think. Um, and I definitely am somewhere in the middle and it fluctuates a lot, but I like to say I'm data agnostic. I think that data, like any tool, um, is going to have harmful origins or, you know, we often have in the history of, of the U.S. in particular, have innovated specifically through violence. And at the same time, data in and of itself is a tool like any other. It can be used for anything. You can use a knife to harm someone else or you can use it to slice an orange. You know, like it's a similar concept to me. At the same time that I recognize that there's infrastructure in which some data that might be otherwise used for good can't function in that same way because of the infrastructure, the architecture that surrounds it. Uh, but for me personally, in terms of 
harm reduction, I like to say, especially one of my biggest questions is just how many trans people are there? And, you know, I also think a lot about, do we need to know? <laughs> and why do we want to know? But for me, as somebody concerned about healthcare and access to healthcare, that there's this idea that because trans communities are small or whatever, that we don't have an obligation to meet, especially the healthcare needs of trans people. Um, and that there's no point in spending time on training staff, that there's no point on being able to specialize or get cross training to be able to perform gender affirming procedures or to prescribe hormones for gender transition as opposed to whatever else they're used for for cis people, lots of things. Um, but that on some level being able to say, actually our existing estimates are wrong and they're small and it's likely much bigger does help us to in some way say, there's an obligation on the part of providers, on the part of the health system, on the part of the government to at least recognize in some way, shape or form the existence of trans people. And that's obviously going to open communities up to harm at the same time that it's going to change the conversation around, you know, are we going to track how trans care is offered? Who's able to do it? Um, are we actually going to look at whether or not there's a, a geographic mismatch between availability of care and the access to care or that supply and demand question? And I think in that way, I, I personally take those risks <laughs> of saying like this can also be used for nefarious purposes in the hopes that some good can still come out of it, that we can create an obligation on behalf of people with power or authority or specialized knowledge to help meet the needs of trans communities to some degree. I, I'm gonna piggyback on what Avery said, same thing about, you know, do we need data, love data, hate data, all those things. Um, and uh, somebody's going to have the data. Um, I think I'm slowing down. I hope you can hear me. Um, but, uh, oh good, I see some head shakes. Um, uh, but more so that uh, I would want us to have our own data um, and how do we put data in the hands of, of trans people? Um, and uh, I'm, I was so broken about the fact that I couldn't do the PAR project that I wanted to at the beginning. And I felt so unsteady about collecting the data over time. But now that I have this data and these people are in their 20s or 30s and saying, would you like to look back at the data that you created in high school, most of them thinking that's been deleted, it doesn't exist. Um, but how would you make sense of it now? Which and that versioning of themselves um, is really powerful. Uh, but also what's in that data that's incredibly powerful to think about Tumblr is the um, kind of uh, effects with other uh, medical conditions, you know, asthma, diabetes, things we, you know, cancer that we we have never had data on, right? Um, and I, I don't know how many people even know it does. I don't think it comes up enough that the only like really long-term data set is from Netherlands where forced sterilization was required. So every time somebody asks, you know, what about, uh, you know, uh, ovarian cancer um, uh, um, or other sorts of uh, um, problems or issues you run into, you can't even uh, find that out. Um, I think also uh, the, the creation of the data does the, the harm reduction of we exist. It might not be what we want or how we want it, but um, the existence of us uh, means a lot, especially in a world that's so driven by data. Um, and I think the other thing uh, that uh, I was, ex I think that I am happy with like thinking about the, the trans data in, in retrospect over time is looking at how a sense of self develops um, for trans people and how it develops in community and relationality. And what is that relationality and what is that network? Um, and also how trust builds um, and a sense of um, communal identity builds, which I think is so important and exciting to study. So I, th I think there's all these, like the, the medical points that Avery brought up, I'm constantly thinking about them. Um, but yeah, the importance of having the data at all um, and, and that as a form of harm and also harm reduction. Thanks for asking, Alex, it's great. Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'm gonna now pose a question towards, um, this is mostly towards Mar and Morgan, uh, Morgan, but y'all can, we can jump in. Um, so Mar, how can a history of transphobic algorithm bias help us understand what's happening today? And you touched on a little bit in your, in your, in your talk, but I'd love to sort of say like, what kind of, how can we kind of inform that 
Um, and then, and then also what has influencing change looked in an area? So like Morgan, possibly draw on kind of what you're thinking about in your consulting work and what's that. So sort of what lessons have we learned historically, you know, and I know this, um, you know, both from both of y'all's historical work and also kind of like, what would you say since you both talked about companies? Um, I can, I can jump in. I think that one of the things that I've learned, at least that's been really useful for me, both as a historian and as a person, is, um, you know, there's a lot of gaslighting that goes on regarding how these systems work. Um, do they really work the way you think you're perceiving them to work? Um, are they doing it intentionally or not? Does intention matter? And when we look into the history of how these systems <clears throat> have been developed, we can see very often, no, it's a feature, it's not a bug. And there were very intentional decisions made because one of the things that um, computers have always been used for, back to their, you know, electronic computers originated during wartime and were heavily invested in during World War II and the Cold War for a reason. It's because they are technologies that help people centralize and wield power and, con and control. And, um, you know, I think that people who grew up maybe in my generation whose first interaction with computers was beige boxes or desktop computers, that doesn't seem very threatening, nor does it seem very centralized. But in fact, PC history, um, personal computing history, is very much kind of a spur off the main narrative of computing history, which was always about centralized systems that were really important for Abe, go lie down. society. And so that's, I guess, just the one takeaway that I would really like to, you know, be able to inject into this conversation is that so much of this is and always has been about power and simultaneously we've been asked to pretend that it is not. So we've gotten, you know, terms like computer revolution, which are almost completely meaningless. A revolution refers to power changing hands. That is not what we've seen with computing technologies, um, many advances. So I'll let Morgan uh, take over now. Yeah, I mean, okay, so I, I guess focusing on who also who has the power in the current context, I guess, of like a tech company who is developing computer vision technologies to get to Alex's question is, um, this might not be surprising to some people, maybe it's surprising to others, but it, it's been a very much a product build, like build the product first based on whatever the engineer thinks is useful, or, um, maybe the company feels fits its incentive structure of profit, you know, driving profits. And so, um, for example, in my consulting work, it's become this like, well, we built these models however long ago, and it's not even that long ago, given how new this is commercially, maybe like five years ago or something. Um, and now everyone is criticizing us for how we're handling gender in these models and how it's unethical and, and we need to do something about this. And so uh, they hire a consultant who does research in this area um, to try to give them some direction to improve X thing or um, even make the argument to not use it and that argument does not go very well when everything is driven by the engineering team um, and so it becomes like this kind of defensive or this justification needs to be made on behalf of the researcher or the, the ethicist or whoever is coming in um, and the engineering team still has a lot of power there and so this has been my experience in consulting is when i've been asked to come in um, mostly reference, you know, my prior work to to sell the engineering team on these changes or to drive what these changes should look like. And then the engineering team is like, no, we don't have, we may not have any research supporting that this was useful, but we need you to prove that it's not useful. And then I go and I wind up having to do a study for them. And then I present that and they're like, well, this is very small scale. I, I don't know if that's, you know, I don't know if this is, is enough justification. And so this is kind of like broadly the struggle that I've, I've personally dealt with in like consulting on these things. And so it becomes this point of 
high, even, even if you are highly critical of the systems, you're almost forced into this pragmatic like struggle between, because it's like, well, we're gonna sell this anyway, we're gonna build this anyway. So like you're stuck in this, like, well, how do I make this marginally better? And, and will they even listen to this like marginal suggestion? Um, so it's a little, it's a little bit frustrating, but like, I think even brainstorming, I don't know what are ways to get around that is kind of, is one issue. Like, I'm not sure what that is, um, but it's something that I would love to hear from maybe other people who, who have uh, dealt with this or thinking about how to actually make a change uh, when it comes to how these systems are being built and used. Thanks so much, Mar and Morgan. And maybe kind of to kick it to Nikki, who is sitting there patiently. <laughs> One question for Nikki is, is, is there a trans way? This is also according to uh, this, this question we have from Catherine in the chat. Is there um, a trans way of making data models that can, review, can reduce harm? Um, this is kind of getting at um, also Morgan's you know, entanglement. Um, yeah, I'll pose it to, to you and also, I'll, I mean, I can open it up to other folks as well. Yeah, I saw Catherine's question. I mean, um, the long answer is an entire chapter of my dissertation in which I design a speculative data model that captures gender as we understand it to be academically and perhaps lived, contextual, temporal, fluid, um, that I can be in one place with one name and one set of pronouns and another place with another name and sets of pronouns and that both of those need to be respected and honored as true simultaneously. Um, so th those things are quite trivial to represent in a data model. Um, the, the question becomes, are there some contexts in which it is useful? Yeah, right? If, you, if you're going to a testing clinic, I want, I want to be out maybe here and I need to be closeted at home for safety reasons, right? There's absolute safety reasons why I should be able in one database to have several different like gender packages for lack of a better term. Um, the question that becomes problematic and that I would love to hear others thoughts on is like, should we, right? Um, and it's and harm for whom? Um, you know, the problem, like, like folks mentioned, the problem with harm reduction is it does not reduce harm equally. And so um, perhaps we can lower harm for some, but, but with our constant awareness of the traps of visibility or the banal visibility we might be seeking, um, that's where things get really complicated. But I think the thing that, that I always wanna reinforce in these conversations is that they're not technically difficult. There is no technical barrier to us representing gender in a way that reflects people's lived experiences of gender. The question is simply, should we and where? And I would love to hear from others on that. Let's open it up. I mean, do you folks have comments on that? I, I want to just respond to Nikki. I just want to respond to all of you and thank you for all of your ideas and your comments. This is an incredible conversation. And yeah, thinking about like making any sort of data visualization, how narrow it is, like how you can even read a social network analysis or the absence of mapping data, and what should be mapped, right? The number of people who are most, I would say 100% of the time cisgender ask me when I'm going to map the data and how I will map the data and in which ways. Um, and, but what, what use it would be to tell you how uh, far someone is um, from a gender affirmingly trained doctor, how, you know, how useful would it be to say how far you are from an LGBT center, if I can give you distances, right? So how, how do you, like it took, it, it's taken me years just to think about how manipulated data and what to make visible. And even then there's, oh, there's always a problem. There's always something that I've forgotten. So it's constantly doing being in conversation with other people behind the scenes uh, to think critically about what can and should be revealed and when. Um, and I, and I, I think it's just like that the struggle and, and also what you're seeing, what, um, um, you know, Morgan, what Morgan's going through, my God, and then thinking, oh, well, five years ago, we made this and it was good enough, but now it's not good enough. And that it never is like, we're always learning about our, we're always learning about ourselves. And so, you know, how, you know, how do we do that together and also accept that and, and make room for that as we grow. So thank you all. Yeah, um, I think on this question of should we and where should we, um, I appreciate that as a provocation because working in health spaces is so much different than working in other spaces when you're researching transgender life. Like in a health context, 
it's extremely relevant. Like I would both need breast exams and a prostate exam, regardless of whatever interventions or how long I've been on whatever exogenous hormones, it doesn't matter. Uh, so capturing that data is vital uh, and, it's a, and it truly can quickly become a, a matter of life and death. Uh, and in the context in which I was living last in LA, um, the center that I was going to knew all the dolls uh, and all the dolls knew the center. And so we were used to having these conversations about it. And when you were gonna go for something like uh, breast augmentation, top surgery for, for trans feminine people, trying to enhance their chest size or whatever, uh, they would usually refer you for genetic testing to see if you've got breast cancer risk. Um, and it's important and it's relevant because of the fact that a lot of these surgical interventions are not one and done. And it's also not only that many of them are uh, multi-phase, like for example, phalloplasty can often involve assuming there are no complications or revisions, sometimes three phases, even if everything goes perfectly. Uh, and then if you get certain kinds of implants, they're going to need to be replaced because they can become toxic because of the material. Uh, so things that are simultaneously gender affirming, gender confirming, depending on your perspective, also have all these risks. So in terms of the question of should we and where, I think the health and the biomedical context is one where we have to. But there's a difference between the level of the clinic and the specific clinical interaction and being able to say, you know, when I'm seeing somebody that maybe is offering me some kind of reproductive health screening um, or is offering me some kind of sexual health screening, that might be immediately relevant. And then in another context, you might run into trans broken arm syndrome if you're trying to show up just for something like a COVID vaccine and they're like, well, you know, is being on exogenous testosterone a contraindication to having a vaccination? Plot twist, it's not. And, and FYI, there are no contraindications for something like HIV treatment, but there are mitigating choices that do need to be made sometimes. And I think a lot of the interventions that I see proposed in my context are about medical education, but the problem is we still don't know enough. The problem is that we still do need to generate data. And the reason that there are statistical methods to be able to do this is we wanna be able to capture things that are more frequent than what we can attribute to random chance. And that's important. And it also means that we're going to need data that's relevant beyond just this is how I identify or this is what I was assigned at birth, but also your medical history and these types of things. And then coming from the health informatics space, that data is going to be available to somebody somewhere down the line. It just will. We're working on a systematic review myself, uh, Claire Cronk, uh, L. Lett, um, Carl Street, who might be here. Uh, as well as um, Kellen Baker, and I believe we might have some others consulting as well on how people find trans subsamples from electronic medical record databases and insurance claim databases. And so it's really difficult to read about these things and these methods that are meant for identification. And, you know, one of the primary codes they might rely on could be something like transvestic fetishism. Uh, as opposed to there's other codes they might not use because they might be more gender affirming, like endocrine disorder, unspecified. So I think there's a lot of issues where I tend to come from this perspective of largely being a health researcher, where I, I often am like, but we need data. Like, I want to be able to age. I would like to be able to live a very long time. And I would like to know exactly what I can anticipate having already been on hormones for you know, or been out or whatever for near a decade, you know? And I think going forward, especially as I age, as an aging woman, as an aging transgender woman, I would love to, to have a hand in, in guiding some of that research and being able to figure out what we can do better and where we can learn. But unfortunately, it's going to come with this side effect of that data supposedly being anonymized to some degree, but made available for research. So I think sometimes I have a little bit of a different perspective just because I, I do think of it through harm reduction in the sense that there are things that we have to know uh, to be able to avoid you know, preventable death uh, or preventable disease. But at the same time, I recognize that we can't easily map those processes onto other aspects of life about which we may have really interesting research questions. You know, that's, <laughs> that's not something we'd want to map with really precise address location data, for example. Um, I have some broad thoughts on this, I guess. So, so kind of what Avery is saying is like, where is this going to be used? And like, what is it going to, like, what is the domain it's going to be used in is one question, but also 
who is collecting that data, how are they defining the ontology of the data, I think is a relevant question, especially, you know, the work that I've done in computer vision that is kind of broad, broad and often not very specific. And this is part of my problem with the field of computer vision. I do think that there are probably useful, that like computer vision can be useful for things like medical diagnostics, for example. But generally it's how we're defining things is like, oh, here's this broad data set that's totally objective and, and can be used in all of these different areas. Um, uh, and so that is, I don't agree with that. Um, and I think that brings up a lot of the harms of you know, oversimplification, ignoring uh, socio-historical context, and also who is collecting that and then viewing, uh, for example, trans people as potential security threats rather than you know, this perception of like, well, maybe we can flip that and how can we protect people? But even then, like maybe there's some harm um, to be had because also ha who has access to the data? Um, and in the context of machine learning, a lot of that is like this, ethos of open data. So I'm gonna collect all of this data on people, like trans people without their permission, I'm gonna publish it online and anyone can use that. And we're just gonna assume that that's good for society or it's good for people in some way. So I think that these are also questions that are relevant to like, should we be doing this? Is who is collecting the data? Like what is the justification they have? How are they defining it? Uh, who has access to it afterwards? Um, as well as, you know, where is it being used? Um, and also something that's come up a lot, uh, for example, in my consulting work and also in um, other work I've been doing is this trade-off that happens in machine learning between different marginalized groups. So um, in the context of my consulting work, this became an accessibility issue. So there was this proposal that gender should be accessible to people who cannot otherwise visually determine gender in the same way that sighted people can. Or um, perhaps we want to understand bias in the media and we want to understand this historical um, marginalization or um, bias against women in media. Well, then we have to classify gender in a visual way. And so there's these constant trade-offs of like, who is this serving, even if the idea behind it is um, meant to be beneficial to someone. Uh, so those are also really hard questions to answer in terms of like, you know, should we be doing X, Y, and Z? We have five minutes left and I wish we had another hour for this because I have so many more questions. This has also been really generative for me in thinking about the limitations of kind of mainstream discussions of data, discussions of AI, and the necessity of talking about this double-edged sword um, between visibility and surveillance. Um, so I'm going to conclude with this question from Alex Levitt, and I'd love for all of you to answer this uh, or say something. Um, Alex asks, if there was a coordinated effort between academics, civil society, um, uh, at all, what data in initiatives do you think would be benef most beneficial to the international trans community in the next two to three years? We'll start off in reverse order, start with Nikki. I was just gathering my thoughts. Um, I think for me, um, for me, most beneficial would be thinking about um, what sort of bias we want to foster. Um, I have an entire soapbox around conversations about algorithmic bias and data set bias and how they're problematic. Um, and so instead, I want to, I would like to get some consensus on fostering bias towards equity, bias towards justice, bias towards prioritizing certain groups of people over others, um, and then move from there. Um, I think there's a lot of good work. I have a, a, a many year project called Open Demographics where we allow people to have input into demographic questions that they are demographic surveys that they're a part of um, that we use in open source communities. And we've had a lot of luck asking people how they want, what questions they want to answer and then letting them answer it. Um, and so I think like, building up more infrastructure around crowdsource. Um, crowdsourcing is also really politically complicated, so we can talk about that later, but um, not treating trans folks as monolithic um, and finding ways to like make the interventions really resonant to types of communities and, and being really clear about who we're prioritizing, I think for me is, is the starting point rather than doing X and Y and Z specifically. 
Wonderful, Morgan. Yeah, this is a tough question. Um, especially, I guess I'm trying to think in the context of where my work is, which is, you know, I think that health is extremely important, but I have no expertise in that area. Um, so I think trying to, to, I think, identify some guidance around use of this kind of data in machine learning for different specific contexts. Like what are the specific contexts? How is it beneficial? How is it not? And also I think part of the um, issue broadly um, with, I mean, this is also just an issue with like the trans rights movements and things like that is that it is very like US and Western focused. And so there's been a total ignorance in, especially like in data about well, what does this look like outside of just like the US and like defining what is trans and what is non binary and do those overlap and things like that? Um, so I think trying to develop frameworks for data that are international and maybe community driven. So it's very similar to what, what Nikki is saying is like there's just not a lot of guidance on what this could look like for good. Um, and I think that would be great to, to start brainstorming. Awesome, Mar. And then, like, we have one minute left, but like, y'all can we can get into the break a little bit. Yeah, I I really just want to kind of echo uh, what everybody's already said about the complexity and the how context dependent all of the insights that we might be able to glean are. Um, I don't know that I have anything too much to add here because I think so much of this conversation has to do with you know moving forward and and what we're we're going to do to correct things in the present and future but i guess as a historian you know one thing that i would just note and as a historian of computing in particular um you know i was struck by the way that you know i, I think it was morgan was talking about how it was a a certain implementation might have been good enough five years ago, but now it's not and things have to keep changing. And that's always the difficulty of infrastructure. Um, that's why computer programming is generally referred to as computer, um, you know, or as um, software development, because it's always in process, it's always being developed. And so that's one of the things that I would say, you know, we're not asking for anything different. These processes always need to shift and change to serve people, um, you know, uh, the, even serve the majority. So um, it's not like what trans folks are asking for is any sort of special um, set of processes or special attention, quite honestly. So I guess that's just what came to mind when I was um, hearing all of the really, really insightful comments everybody was making. Amazing, Jack. I'm. I was thinking too about. Uh, I'm thinking about climate refugees, and I'm thinking about um, uh, you know all this great work that's been done in geography um, about the data that's collected about people, but the presumptions of the people helping people. You know, after tsunamis, volcano eruptions, um, earthquakes. Uh, um, tornadoes um, and uh, you know what makes a family, what makes a person um, and who's accepted in these spaces. So we've been talking so much about this, the medical data that's not even and an, like an, an, like it's not even possible for some people that can't even imagine like having that as a possibility. Um, so you know in an international context in the next 10, 20, five years, next year, this year, you know how will we uh, support uh, trans non-binary gender non-conforming people? You know, crossing borders um, uh, and um, as a as a way of survival, and how do we restructure um, those ways of thinking? Yes, absolutely. And Avery. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to take it to health again, uh, but this time because it actually has legal implications and policy implications. So the U.S. And we as U.S. trans communities, I will indict myself in this, uh, but I don't want to speak for anybody else. I'll say that I personally, until recently, felt as if uh, if it doesn't affect us in the U.S. in particular, that we're not on board. And the U.S. is out of step uh, in so many ways in terms of health and human rights for trans communities compared to the rest of the world, despite the fact that a majority of the science about transgender life uh, that's being published in academic journals comes from the U.S. and is written in English. 
So in an attempt to come back against this, uh, myself and a couple other folks who, uh, some of whom might be on the call, like Francisco Romero, and other folks who uh, participated in co-chairing a conference called Converging Crises on Trans Health Rights and Activism. We held it virtually in three languages with simultaneous interpretation, hoping the best we could to try to decenter the US perspective. And what we learned really quickly was that a lot of people from outside the US had this idea that things were so great in the US and then that was shattered pretty quickly. And that in contrast, there's a lot of places, for example, in South America that have made a lot of strides that we have not, and I can't imagine what they would look like in our context. Uh, and a global movement has really been going on without us in the US because of how our health system works for the depathologization of transness. And that international classification of diseases that I mentioned, the 11th revision of it um, actually is gonna have some legal implications because we're no longer going to have gender identity disorder as a mental health disorder. We now have a new category in sexual health called gender incongruence. And this means that in some contexts like Russia, where having gender identity disorder was considered akin to uh, comorbid psychiatric diseases that meant you couldn't get a driver's license, that there's lots of trans people that may be able to access healthcare but can't get IDs. And in Thailand, for example, depending on your status or your relationship to the system, how your gender marker looks, you may not be able to adopt children, you may not be able to get married, uh, you may not be able to be legally recognized as a parent of your child, even if you're involved in their uh, conception and gestation and birth. So this has implications because a lot of those laws are tied to the stigma of transness as a mental illness. And I could talk all day about how this is different in different geopolitical contexts, but I think that it's something that we could rally around, that there is a lot of movement around, and that if U.S. folks would get on board despite the fact that our country has already said we're not implementing ICD-11, we only implemented ICD-10 in 2015, which is about 15 years late, uh, then we could hopefully actually be in solidarity with others and hopefully make some change on our front. So not to be super pragmatic and health oriented, but, but that's one area that I think is really important because the implementation was supposed to have started about three weeks ago, the beginning of 2022 and COVID delayed it. Amazing, thank you so much all. I mean, um, this has been just incredible and so generative. Um, so thank you, Avery, Jack, Mar, Morgan, and Nikki. This is fantastic. Um, we're going to go and take a break now um, for, uh, it's been shortened to 10 minutes. I'm going to start at 45 after, and we'll have our keynote um, by Dr. Cassius Adair. I'm really, really excited. Is that a hand up you had, Morgan? Or <laughs> it was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Alex. Thank you so much for organizing us. That was fantastic. Thank you. Thank you all. This is so good. Okay. See you all in 10 minutes. Yeah. Thank you all so much. Thanks. Hey, guess how are you feeling? <laughs> awesome. Uh, all right, we are at quarter two, so I'll just uh, use the dulcet tones of my voice of my voice to to welcome you all back. Come on back, uh, get 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 comfy, uh, and in like a minute here, I'll 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 do I'll do the introduction. Yeah, keynote time. This chat is epic. I love it. All right. All right, folks are chatting. It seems like a lot of people are back. So I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, do you have a question? You have a question. Okay, so you good? Can I go? Yeah, all right. So uh, <laughs> quickly, a little background on this keynote. I, 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 I've been following Kaz's work for, for, for a while and I knew that they were they were working on this kind of beast of a project on IBM and, and trans history of computing. And, and when Oliver suggested the idea of a trans tech, trans tech studies event to me, I was like, yes, while we get Cass's work here, I'm walking, I'm very dramatic. Uh, and fortunately for everyone, Cass not only agreed to participate, but, he, uh, but he's rolled up with what is undoubtedly an all time great talk title. 
Um, and uh, before I introduce it more formally, I also I want to give a, a quick shout out and thank the Labor Tech Research Network for sponsoring the talk. Um, so please check out their important work at labortechresearchnetwork.org. Somebody could drop the link in the chat. I'd be grateful. Uh, and I, I want to uh, and I want to give a personal thank you to Stephanie Jordan and Michigan State for working with me to make that connection possible. Dr. Kaz Yusadair is an audio producer, writer, and researcher from Virginia. He holds a PhD from the University of Michigan and for the 2021-2022 academic year, he's a fellow at the American Council of Learned Societies with an affiliation at the Institute for Advanced Study at the University of Minnesota. He is also a research fellow at the Digital Research Ethics Collaboratory at the University of Toronto and an outside member of the Precarity Lab at the University of Michigan. His writing appears in American Quarterly, American Literature, Avidly, Semiotic Review, and Trans Studies Quarterly, among other places. And he's co-author of the experimental scholarly book, Techno Precarious, which was published with MIT Press in 2020. Uh, and he's currently writing a book about transgender people and the internet. Uh, and in addition to the book project, uh, he's a contributor to the Tech Workers Coalition in an effort to bridge oral history and labor organizing. Uh, and, and I'll say as a final note, one thing that uh, Oliver, Alex, and I were very intentional about was, when we put this program together was, uh, and, and I think this is in the spirit of CATS overall, uh, was we wanted to create a mix of exciting early career uh, and emerging scholars with more senior folks, um, with the goal of using the latter to give shine and boost to the former. So for many, many people in this program who qualify for keynotes, that is uh, amazing work. But uh, so, so, so for, the, for the more senior among you, thanks for letting us uh, uh, instrumentalize you uh, to this end. Um, and, and on that note, I want to say Cass is on the job market and you should hire him and give him a lot of money. And Cass isn't the only one. So if you're a panelist uh, uh, on the job market, which is on purpose, if you're a panelist and you're on the job market, say so in the chat. You should hire those people and pay all of them also. <laughs> all right, so uh, so so that being said, um, without further delay, I wanna welcome Cass. Thank you much, so much, Anna, for that warm intro. Um, yeah, I already quit the Academy once, so I did see that suggestion to quit, um, and I could, I'll do it again, it's fine with me. Um, is my screen being shared appropriately? Can I get like a just general, like, yes to that? Post has spotlighted my video. Okay, um, cool, great, thanks. So it's an honor to be with you here today, and it's such an honor to be with so many people in these particular times. Um, I'm I'm speaking to you today from a place that is currently covered in snow, on illegally occupied land within the territory of the Seven Council Fires of the Dakota Nation. And I'm going to drop um, a bunch of links in the chat at the end of this talk for you to peruse. And one link is for the University of Minnesota's um, relationship to land acknowledgements and what I mean by doing that. So again, formal welcome and thank you again to everyone at the Center for Applied Transgender Studies and the Labor Tech Research Network who've done all these logistics and organizing and financial support to make it possible for me to be with you today. Um, thank you also to my partner and also members of our local community to, for doing care labor, like administering Zoom elementary school and shoveling snow off of sidewalks and making food while I like hit upstairs and wrote. There's sort of a long chain of people who are supporting academic work at this time. And final thank yous to the song Fire by Waxahachie. And for some reason, this song, the theme song from the gay anime series Yuri on Ice <laughs> for just being the songs on repeat while I was writing. I like sometimes just need to have like, you know, the like neuro, like non-typical brain thing where you like one song. And this, these are the songs that were with me while I wrote. Um, I don't believe in doing scholarship without acknowledging not only the place in which something was written, but also the times in which they were produced. And at the same time, like, what do you say that's new right now, right? It seems wild to me that we're doing scholarship. Um, and at the same time, I think I've said that um, every single time I've given an academic talk since like 2015. Um, I, the way that we're thinking and processing intellectual work right now are by this point indelibly marked by a sensation of breakdown in something that we might have hated, but at least we kind of understood, the fusion of neoliberal economics and the mechanics of a liberal democracy. Which is not to say that like liberalism is over or whatever, um, liberalism's construction of routine violence disguised as a type of procedure, um, as a type of equivalent exchange of commodities or promises, those sort of constructions are still ongoing. 
And if that were not the case, then it would make no sense for me to situate this talk within the context of a broken treaty, one in, um, enacted as part of an administrative fiction between nation states. Clearly, it takes more than the eradication of a social contract between the US and its white citizenry, and that, by this I mean the sort of like whole scale abandonment of, of many of us at these times, to represent the end of a sort of larger global order. And at the same time, I think we're in a very particular moment where we can rightly defamiliarize certain frameworks and logics of everyday economic life. That is, we can historicize things that even a few years ago might not have felt that historical. In the context of my work, that means things like this sort of imaginary divide between public and private interests when it thinks that comes to things like health insurance policy, right? Um, or even the idea of like having a job at a company, I think is an increasingly sort of like historicizable um, phenomenon. And in other words, part of what I hope to convey is that studying sort of century old capitalist institutions like IBM, which are both still extant players in the global marketplace, and also somehow these sort of archaic structures of paternalistic 20th century capital is also a way to understand the strangeness of living in a moment where so many things feel both grindingly predictable and also dangerously unfamiliar and uncertain. Um, and the way I deal with sort of like cosmic strangeness of all those things is usually by making really bad jokes in PowerPoint. So if there's too many jokes, um, that's why, and I guarantee no jokes will be good. This talk is going to take place over three short sections. And if I don't fuck up the timing, it'll also have a coda. And if I fuck up the timing, I'll skip the coda. Part one, wild, wild ducks at big blue, is where I'll describe a particular moment in US trans history by unconventionally turning to corporate capital production or corporate cultural production as a critical site. This section details the years just after Lynn Conway was fired by IBM and the larger turn towards gender inclusion as part of corporate strategy within the tech sector, one which I argue cannot be understood outside of a reaction to sort of global anti-racism. The, the second section, troubling the cable line, Tropes on the title of Trace Peterson, who I think is in the audience, which is great. Um, Trace Peterson and T.C. Tolbert's monumental trans poetics anthology, Troubling the Line, but offers an alternative analysis of the line as a piece of physical communications infrastructure and the importance of that line in the emergence of what would become transnormative life worlds in the subsequent decades. For this section, I stay in the early 1970s, but pivot to an analysis of tech from its labor side. Um, rather than its PR side, and I sit with the ways that white transmasculinity in particular could anachronistically emerge as a silent beneficiary of state-backed workplace and corporate diversity initiatives. Thirdly, I finally get to the 1990s, where trans studies traditionally understands its historical and conceptual origins. By locating commonplace analogies between trans embodiment and digital systems, not in a type of like generalized POMO account of technology social implications as both trans and cis commentators tended to do in the 90s. Um, there's a lot of sort of like, wow, we're so disconnected from our body. It's just like being on the computer stuff that like trans theorists are doing and also cis people are doing in transphobic ways. Um, instead, I'm offering a grounded historical account of the relationship between trans activists and technology corporations, showing how commonplace ideas about gender and gender identity both emerged from and were integrated back into tech spaces via the professionalization of transness, a circuit that continues to have applications, implications for what we imagine constitutes trans movements today. So with that, I will start part one, Wild Ducks at Big Blue. In the collections of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in Manhattan, which is a 20 minute train ride north of IBM's old corporate headquarters on Madison Avenue, one can find an archive poster entitled How to Stuff a Wild Duck. Um, and of course I didn't take any trains to get to this, this is all online. And I'll drop links to these posters too, but it's kind of it's kind of neat that these are in a real physical museum. A stark black background frames an image of a duck whose body is composed of a word cloud of yellow text. This is like a OG like 1970s word cloud graphic. The text is a collection of various commonplace words or phrases that encourage social conformity. I know it's hard to read, but they're things like don't step on any toes or come down to earth and stay on their good side. Other words are, or other phrases are a single word. So hierarchy, intolerance, and policy. The words blend and merge into each other down the body of the yellow duck, such that the animal's lower half is just a fuzz of yellow. At the top of the poster are two quotations. One from George Bernard Shaw reads, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world. The unreasonable one persists in trying to adapt the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. 
And the second from TJ Watson himself reads, we are convinced that any business needs its wild ducks. And in IBM, we try not to tame them. Designed by IBM's senior graphic designer, Ken White, the duck poster was famous among IBMers during the mid 1970s. And if you read the comments of like, Amazon reviews of a book in which this is reprinted, you'll see old school IBMers yelling at each other about who knows the most about this particular poster. It sort of has like a weird famous life around like people who worked at IBM in the 70s and 80s. Um, the quote itself comes from a memo that was apparently off quoted, but the original I can't actually find. So if somebody knows where the actual memo is, um, I'd love to see it. Um, and it's used so much, this phrasing about wild ducks is used so much in the scholarly literature about IBM that you would think that this is a company full of like radical nonconformists, which I think we all kind of would agree isn't true. The chapter of the IBM poster program book that describes the creation of this poster even calls the graphic designers themselves these wild ducks. How to Stuff a Wild Duck emerged from a 15 year long IBM poster program at Boulder Design Center, part of a larger corporate design program that TJ Watson initiated in the 1950s. According to histories of the period, the Boulder office was understood as slightly offbeat and a place of measured irreverence, less restrained in the Northeast US, yet not so freewheeling as California. It was an office led by white guys with Yale MFAs who created some of the early, earliest examples of neoliberal corporate diversity propaganda, um, which ranged from the commonplace sentiment about thinking outside the box, um, which I'll show you, except for in this case, the box is an egg. And this reads, the shell must break before the bird can fly, management development, 1973. Uh, it's a quote from uh, Tennyson, apparently. Um, and uh, another example of one of these posters from the same year. Yeah, I know, egg, right? I like straight up did not do a close reading of the egg thing because I don't have time, but it's so good. Um, but there's also images like this, the type of image that I think, I hope most of us in this room would immediately recognize of, as an example of colorblind racial ideologies attendant to white supremacy, as well as an appropriation of disability visual rhetoric an image that positions IBM's logo as the answer to an Ishihara colorblindness test, emphasizing that IBM's employment policies were, quote, colorblind. Again, no, LOL. Um, the wild duck image, I argue, lays out the ambitions and contradictions of the post-1960s corporate environment at the same time as all of these other images together illustrate new ideas emerging in the corporate economy of the day. Um, this is a particular moment for IBM when its supposed embrace of the, of course, gendered unreasonable man of the early 1970s um, is emerging in response to IBM's extant reputation for a disciplined country club conformity, a product of TJ Watson Jr.'s dad and his top-down and paternalistic managerial style. And if you want to know about a bunch of um, IBM drama, it's kind of like what if you set succession in like 1964? So there's like funny stuff about dads and sons and stuff. Um, and this, this image of sort of like a uh, country club, uh, white people bowling near the sea could not sustain itself as a corporate image after a decade of racial uprising in the 1960s. Institutions, as you may have noticed over the last couple of years, tend to respond to popular resistance with aesthetic modifications, hence, some of these posters. These posters were all produced, as I said, in 1973, the year that Jody Malamud has in identified as the onset of what she calls liberal multiculturalism, a historical emergence of a new racial logic undergirded by the economic downturn, inflation, and global restructuring of 1973. And if you're like a huge fan of David Harvey, you kind of know a lot about 1973. This decade, as Malamud writes, has been marked by the ascendance um, of radical anti-racisms, and this is a sort of like the late 1960s, um, in the vein of the epistemic cognitive political activism of women of color and black lesbian feminism. And this was a frame of activist thinking emerging in the late 1960s and even into the early 1970s that understood culture, including literary and visual cultures as materializing social practices, producing relatively permanent forms of value, economy, meaning and distribution of goods and services. So if you're in, for example, the black arts movement, then you're making art and you're making visual culture, not just to do some type of propagandizing, but as a part of a holistic supply chain and circulation of material conditional changes. So who's in the room? Who's producing what? 
where are you selling your products? What types of exchanges are you making? Are all part of a type of political economy that's meant to disrupt normative structures. By contrast to 1960s communal radicalisms and their attendant visual cultural production, the paradoxical diverse individual begins to emerge in the types of corporate visual culture produced here at IBM Design Lab in the 1970s. And I'm not saying that IBM is the only one doing this, right? But like it's, it's they're really like, they, they hire the best graphic designers to make this kind of stuff. In these images, we see multiple figurations of big tech that would come to mark what we now understand as neoliberal ideology into the next decades. And I'm not gonna name names here or anything, but you might be familiar with some of these sort of ideas in big tech today. The valorization of the unreasonable man whose unique nonconformity can't be tamed um, and is therefore supposedly sort of more brilliant than everybody else. The idea that shells must be broken before flight can take place um, and the colorblind ideology of equal opportunity as a rejoinder to radical movements for racial and economic transformation. Um, and there's some call outs of some particular institutions, but again, I'm not naming any names. For its part, IBM argues that they have always been a progressive corporation, touting especially Watson Jr.'s policy memo number, policy memo number four stating that IBM would not segregate its op Southern offices and factories. And you can see a, a copy of this in 1953. I don't have time to play you all of the clips, but if you ever wanna watch an entire hour long movie scored by Philip Glass about how incredibly non-discriminatory IBM is, um, there's a link and I will drop it. It is a pretty wild video. Um, and this image is just a screenshot that I took where their representation of diversity in the workplace is the back of people's heads with different little symbols and colors. And that's sort of where people were at um, at the time. Uh, and one thing I love about this memo, just sort of putting it on the screen is that this memo is part of IBM's sort of personal ideology insofar as if you go to their current website today, and you wanna read about their diversity inclusion policies, they're gonna say, well, we issued policy letter number four before we had to, um, before we had to follow equal opportunity employment law. Um, and my reading of this um, memo is that it is, it is absolutely the most empty, normal sentence you can possibly imagine. It doesn't do anything material. It doesn't ensure the economic rights of anybody. Um, it simply says, it's the policy of this organization to hire people who have the personality, talent, and background necessary to fill a given job, regardless of race, color, or creed. And maybe this was like really important in 1953. Um, in segregated states, but only if you think that white liberals are the radicals of the civil rights movement. So compared to what was actually happening in activism and culture on the ground in the South, this memo doesn't really say much to me. But if you ask IBM, this is part of their sort of continued history of diversity and inclusion and progressivism, et cetera, et cetera. But by 1978, just a few years after How to Tame a Wild Duck and Colorblind, posters were circulated across company cork boards, it was obvious that equal opportunity was not actually a sufficient redress to domestic and international racism, in particular anti-Blackness. Anne Hai Young, in particular, has done really incredible, a really incredible series of interviews with Black IBMers. Um, I'm also definitely going to um, link to those. And their experiences of injustice and surveillance in the workplace, as well as the long history of the Black Workers Alliance, which was a sort of like proto-unionization campaign, although I think there's some dissent within those ranks about the extent to which um, worker collectivism is really the goal, to try to force IBM to account for and end its role in the administration of apartheid, as well as unequal treatment within the workplace. Um, and so you can see this is a archival document that um, Anna archived from Richard Hudson, who is one of the founders, excuse me, of the um, Black Employees for Equal Rights organization. It's gonna highlight a couple of things. Um, it was pretty clear that this was not a, um, a employee research source group sponsored event. This was not part of official IBM um, diversity and inclusion initiatives because it clearly warns that you should not reproduce this document on IBM copies or premises and do not distribute on IBM premises. Um, there's also a note here, um, number eight on the sort of like questions about articles to um, analyze, or questions, questions to analyze within our organization, EOP, which is equal opportunity, um, uh, uh, equal Opportunity Department 
is it powerless to help us? Meaning the same equal opportunity um, that departments that were being uh, touted and valorized in the colorblind poster um, five years later are understood as sort of worthless um, to the people who they're supposed to help. But what makes this a trans story? Um, that's a good question. Just as 20th century Black workers who demanded actual structural change were apparently not the good kind of wild ducks that should be untamed and left to their own brilliance, transgender individuals in the 20th century were also among those whose wildness was not good for business. And here I'm not trying to break out like Black in one category and transgender in another. What is, what is evident in the archive is that white, trans people were um, the majority of the trans people who are represented um, amongst this population. And we can talk more about the sort of like search for trans people of color at IBM. Um, so far it's not um, going well for the reasons I'll discuss. Um, IBM's profit machine relied on homosocial relations between salesmen, precise and punctual secretarial women, and the establishment and circulation of cissexist sartorial, behavioral, and social gender norms. Um, there's a lot of great research on the sort of like gender politics of IBM. Um, uh, there's a really good article by Corinna Schlams at RIT about the transnational rhetoric of the IBM family. And if you don't care about like deep IBM weirdness, there's no need for me to go into that, but it's like, like the idea of like a daddy figure in the corporation that does a type of paternalistic doling out of, um, of care and of benefits is explicitly organized as the way that IBM would not become unionized. Like rather, we don't want an antagonistic relationship between you and your dad, so don't unionize. Um, um, yeah, in instances where trans people, like I said, as far as I can tell, mostly white women um, did find I work at IBM, they were often singled out. And there's a lot of um, trans people who worked at IBM within the sort of like white trans women category, um, like 1980s and especially 90s. Um, Kate Bornstein famously described in their memoir, A Queer and Pleasant Danger, an incident where earlier in her transition, an IBM higher up came down to the subsidiary office in New Jersey where they were employed and tried to insist that she wear appropriate business attire, despite the fact that Kate was wearing a professional business suit and by her own account, selling at sales, selling in sales, uh, excelling in sales. And to be honest, um, you know, when I when I compare Kate's outfit, at least on this book cover, to the images of the 1935 IBM service women who um, are sort of headlining IBM's gender equity um, uh, gender equity uh, propaganda on their own website. Um, what's funny to me is like how Kate could have fit in there, like skipping a generation or two, right? Like. I don't see like somebody who's like wildly out <laughs> beyond the pale of IBM um, at this time. And I know I'm sort of jumping, that's a very ace historical claim, but you know, what if, what if you can imagine Kate Bornstein sitting in that line of women, except like changing her early eighties blowout hair to one of these like nice um, coifs things. Without trying to, trans people threatened the gendered sorting of labor that characterized the early 20th century corporate workplace. They disrupted the coding of dress and professionalism that constructed the suit and tie image of the company. Their workplace needs from medical coverage to short-term leave to restroom access frustrated human resources personnel. There's a lot of trans memoirs that love to talk about their battles with HR. And most of all, they brought with them this shadow of sexual deviance, mental illness, and criminality, which we sort of talked about a little bit in the Q&A, none of which were suited, no pun intended, for the IBM brand, no matter the decade. Um, and yet I see some like family discourse in the chat. Um, IBM kind of like invented the family discourse in the histories of American corporate capital. And I, I don't think there's like, it's not like a um, provable claim, right? Like maybe somebody else said that first, but IBM is like the ground zero for this. Um, if you look at like business histories and histories of capital. Most famous among these two wild ducks uh, was Lynn Conway, whose firing from IBM apparently was authorized by the same person, TJ Watson, who had said that at IBM, we try not to tame our wild ducks, despite her brilliant innovations in very large scale integration technology. And if you don't know what that is, and I'm like not an engineer, I'm like apparently everyone else here, um, but uh, basically it, it's an electrical engineering design that permitted computer chips to get really, really, really small. Um, and thanks Mar for dropping that link. Indeed, it was not until 2002, nearly 40 years after Thomas J. Watson purports to embrace his wild ducks, and 34 years after Lynn Conway was unceremoniously fired from the company, that IBM suddenly begins an aggressive campaign of trans inclusion. 
IBM becomes a major corporate sponsor of the LGBT focused out and equal corporate events throughout the early 2000s, which are really, really good to read. They're very funny. Um, and IBM HR managers appear on industry panels, encouraging their competitors in big tech to adopt trans protections and, re and retain transitioning talent. Over the subsequent two decades, IBM established comprehensive trans-inclusive healthcare, added gender identity to its non-discrimination statement, and even published a glossy resource guide, which I'll show you a little bit later, for transitioning employees with the help of the HRC. Finally, after 18 years of trans-related diversity work inside the company, they issued what might be considered their piece de resistance, the formal apology issued to former employee Lynn Conway in 2020. Um, so this is a sort of like story of like, wow, after 52 years, IBM has totally transformed. They love trans people now. Um, and there's Lynn looking like pretty fancy in her Umish robes. But I, I find this all really strange um, because there's no reason why IBM like has to apologize to Lynn Conway in 2020. When I started researching this subject back in 2016, which is just four years before the apology was issued, um, I wrote to IBM asking about Lynn Conway and I received nothing in response. Um, and this is also a company about whom an entire book has been written, alleging that they were complicit in the Holocaust. And that book has already been dropped in the chat. I saw that go by. Um, and multiple international legal cases about their role in apartheid have found them responsible. And they're not bending over backwards to apologize in those cases, right? I mean, obviously these are different scales, but this is not a model of corporate responsibility that is really big on apologia as a form, right? Um, and it's not like there's a clear business case here. Trans people are still pretty unpopular um, and our whole existence is seen as explicitly political. So why is it important to apologize? Why is it important to be, for big tech to be good to trans people right now? Well, if you listen to the far right, um, it's because big tech wants us to transition for reasons. Um, I don't know what the reasons are, but there is a conspiracy that um, big tech gives Americans a barrage of propaganda for trans youth and gives us all our sex hormones and that, um, that it blocks this agreement with trans ideology. And yeah, it's the forced femme agenda. I don't really like, I, there is like really good organizing around this about why this is happening. Um, but it just seems to like, I wanna note that like, there is a conspiracy that big tech loves trans people for some bad reason. And I'm asking, yeah, I think they kind of do love trans people for some bad reason, but I don't think it's the same bad reason as Tucker Carlson thinks it is. So if it's not that, why, what is it? And this is part of what I'm gonna to try to get to in my book and part of what I'm gonna to try to offer in the next section, which is called Troubling the Cable Line. So it's not really true, true that the internet is a series of tubes but it is based on the ability to send electronic packets of information over wires. And one of the ways I'm responding to larger calls in digital studies to consider infrastructure and the material labor of digital technologies is by defining my search for trans tech workers broadly, both historically and across classes and sectors. And that's why I wanna linger again in 1973, but not in a boardroom or in a hip Boulder, Colorado design studio, but in fact, out on the line, out on the cables. By the time the internet came along, there was already a highly gendered idea about the types of workers who made it so that you could talk to people far away. And that idea was called the telephone man. Um, I wanna show you these clips, but if they don't work sound wise, then like, you know, it's only 30 seconds of, of silence. So let's see if I can get to this story. Often lead may have been used in medieval times by man against man to repulse the attackers of besieged castles. But the telephone man, uses the same hot metal to bind men together. The splice must be like the mended broken bone, better than the original continuous article, not do-it-yourself work. Wiping a joint like this in lead cable is a functional industrial art. Training takes place throughout the careers of telephone workers so that they may qualify for more difficult and responsible assignments. And I'm gonna play, since that worked, I'm gonna play like a couple, a couple, couple of seconds of another one. These days, the telephone man's truck is not far behind the building contractor. It used to be that the remoteness of a house was measured by its distance from neighbors. 
Now, the telephone brings nearness to any home site. The dwelling without a phone is cut off from the world, regardless of its closeness to other buildings. This worker is bringing magic to the home, but he goes about his task without a magician's flourishes, his quietness and efficiency testimony enough of his competence. Ah, they keep playing. Okay, good. I just have to go to the next slide apparently to get them to stop playing. But the telephone man is this sort of like 1950s idea um, that lingered all the way into the 1970s. And that idea was still there when Jameson Green finished his MFA in creative writing in 1972. Um, and I'm gonna say a, a little bit more about who um, Jameson Green is in a moment. At the time, Jameson Green was pretty broke. In his interview with me for my book, he said, I would pick up pennies in the cafe parking lot and coffee was 10 cents for a bottomless cup. So I was picking up pennies and I'd get 10 pennies together and then I'd go in and I'd get my coffee and somebody would leave a newspaper and I'd read the newspaper and I'd find all the want ads. It was in desperation that Jameson in his extremely non-binary, very grubby self, which is how he described himself at the time, wearing jeans and an army jacket, wandered into the local phone company asking for a job writing coffee. There weren't any writing jobs. And so he asked if he could climb pole. He, the people at the, behind the desk asked him if he could climb poles and lift a manhole cover. And Jameson said, yeah, I can do anything. And he starts laughing at this point of the interview with me because he's like, yeah, I'll do anything because literally I was very hungry. I just had an MFA in creative writing. It was worthless. Like, I'll do whatever you want me to do for money. In his memoir, Becoming a Visible Man, which as a total aside, was the only book by a trans person that existed in my college library when I was coming out. And I was like immediately not into it because I was like, why are all these dudes having a drum circle in the first chapter? I do not relate to this. This is not my idea of what being trans mask is. Uh, anyway, but in his memoir, Green attributes becoming the first quote woman to work as a cable splicer in the Pacific Northwest to his exceptionally masculine physicality and experience. He writes that he had always had an unusually high degree of upper body strength. And from his time as a ski instructor, he knew how to train his body and to communicate with others about physical activity. His bosses were apparently so shocked that a quote woman had completed the strenuous training progr program of like climbing stuff. Um, please do not hold a trans mask drum circle. Thank you, Oliver. Um, that uh, I just like looking at the chat and losing my place. Very cool. Um, anyway, they were his bosses were so shocked that a woman had completed the strenuous training program that they decided to not offer a climbing job to him. They instead wanted him to be a janitor. But Jameson pushed back, asserting his desire to work instead on the electrical infrastructure of the telecom industry, to be one of the telephone men that was uh, at what was then the Bell Corporation, the telecom firm that controlled massive swaths of North American phone lines using a vertical integration monopoly for a large part of the 20th century. The first couple of years, Jameson said to me, it felt like I was being paid to go to summer camp. Despite the sexism he faced while dealing with being the first quote woman on the crew and the strongest quote woman to pass the rigorous physical training, uh, physical testing to be on the line, the assumptions that he was fit instead for janitorial or secretarial work still sort of uh, grounded him. But he also was accepted amongst his crew, he, who he describes also as casually misogynist. When the other men on the line would gripe about, wi about women, they would also say something like, yeah, but, but not you, you're different. For Jameson, this was trans recognition without any administrative action. On the line cutting cable, he became one of the guys. At the same time, Green didn't just learn blue collar masculinity from the telephone men. He also learned the skills that would eventually propel him strangely into both Silicon Valley and into diversity consulting. Um, and uh, this image on the screen just shows you some more updated cable splicers who I like love um, have a slightly better version of the, the ch trans mask chin strap in this image, but um, you know I think there's some interesting resonance there. So this is what Jameson Green said he learned from the cable line. I learned to read engineering prints and analyze physical problems that were out there in the field, and I noticed that the engineers and the splicers didn't speak the same language. His new ability to translate across engineers and cable assembly guys, to communicate across management and labor, as well as to communicate across what was then understood as gender difference between white men and white women. He was again, understood as a white woman. Those skills would be incredibly lucrative for him. 
They would be the skills that would win him respect in male dominated workplaces for the rest of his life before and after transition, especially in the technology and business sectors. Jameson is not compelled from broke non-binary weirdo collecting pennies and hanging out at the coffee shop up into becoming the eventual board member of the human rights campaign, the president of WPATH and the founder of Jameson Green and Associates just because he's really good at tree climbing or whatever. It's not even some American dream blue to white collar ascension that's, you know, um, that like carries up on the line. He doesn't, he does, although he doesn't mention it in his autobiography, by the time we talked for this book, Green is open to discussing the consent decree, which is probably the deep history of why he got this job at this time. In 1973, again, we're going back to that same year, as Melissa Via Nicholas has described in her excellent work on Latina laborers in telecom, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission in the United States sued AT&T, and at this, like AT&T and Bell, I'm kind of using um, interchangeably, with the help of the National Organization for Women. Via Nicholas notes that now's work with the EEOC represents a victory for what would be um, understood eventually by critical race theorists and historians as white feminism, using a gender first analytic in their legal arguments that simplified discrimination claims down to a sort of one category, sort of um, discrimination on the basis of gender, um, that would therefore allow the law to remedy their experiences under only one suspect class. And so there's a lot of like legal theory here, but basically what you need to know is that it's easier to win a lawsuit in the United States if you say, I have one identity that is marginalized and somebody screwed me over on the basis of that one identity and I can prove it. Um, and that is sort of also the like er idea of intersectionality, why we need intersectionality in legal theory. Um, in a case that could be a textbook example of why intersectionality is needed in the law, the EEOC's suit and its settlement with AT&T utilize civil rights frameworks to produce white women as minorities within STEM fields and therefore broadly construed as subject to civil rights redress. Indeed, in 1973, the same year Jameson Green is hired onto the line, white feminism is, is sort of at its second wave peak. It's just one Roe versus Wade, for, it, for example. That white women were extraordinary beneficiaries of affirmative action policies in the 1970s and 80s has long been understood by critical race scholars, but it's been harder within our communities to understand that transness and transmasculinity in particular can both interrupt and replicate historical assumptions about gender bias and legal redress in the 20th century. It's also harder to look at, for example, blue collar spaces for histories of transness or of computing because both of those spaces are presumed to be spaces that valorize a notion of masculine physical labor. But for Jameson Green and potentially for others like him, I haven't found them all, but I know there's some like stealth trans guys um, kind of during this period. I kind of know that through the gossip chain, um, you know, the sort of like secret, you know, trans mask uh, news groups that we're all on. Um, it wasn't geek cis masculinity or trans femininity that signals his position in digital history. It's a sort of blue jeans and army jacket proto trans masculinity, which I think is, is historically weird. And at the same time that these types of subjects could be folded into STEM spaces at the behest of legislation that purported to increase equal opportunity clearly demonstrates to me the limits of those frameworks. That they permit an employer employee relationship and the desires of employers to select the people for whom they are already most like, um, but with a difference, with one difference, um, basically to, conf to confirm with like legal you know, mandates and therefore to define the horizon of justice as simply including people who are slightly different from the people who are already there. As Susan Stryker has pointed out elsewhere, 1973 was not just the, the year of Roe v. Wade. It's also not just David Harvey's year zero of neoliberalism. But it was also the same year that Sylvia Rivera gave her now infamous and quickly sort of canonizing in a weird way um, speech, y'all better quiet down. And this is a speech that I imagine will be familiar to a lot of you in the audience. Um, I'm not gonna play clips of it here, um, but I, I think it's important that as much as we, were, we in contemporary trans studies like to remember 1973 and especially Sylvia Rivera's speech, as a revolutionary year. Correctly, we honor Sylvia and Marsha P. Johnson for their contributions to trans liberation. I worry sometimes that the integration of their life narratives into the macro story of trans history risks performing another form of inclusion that can have devastating consequences. 
The reason I want to point out what else was happening in the corporate sphere is because I don't want to create a homogenous, idealized, and ultimately tokenizing notion of trans pasts. And I'm joining here Joel, Gil Pe Joel Skill Peterson's work to de-idealize the street queen and the trans woman of color by accounting for when and how trans life actually does circulate as value. Um, otherwise, we risk missing the real harm that can happen at sites of dematerialized and sort of like tokenizing inclusion. If, and this is just sort of a picture of Marcia B. P. Johnson as the Google Doodle in 2020. And um, Google narrates this as um, Martha P. Johnson inspiring people everywhere to stand up for the freedom to be themselves, which is not my reading of what um, street transvestite action revolutionaries um, is. So I, you know, just a, a sort of question that I have about that. Instead, I want to account for why and how two wholly different relations to capital can emerge, and yet we call them both trans in the 20th century. Big tech and its relationship to white trans theory and political strategy is central to this story, I will argue. And I'm just going to offer a sort of small hint of this stuff because I'm still unraveling all these relationships. Um, but I, I want to go forward in time to the 1990s and the early 2000s. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about the matrix, but like you just have to put the matrix in a slide about the trans 90s, you know. In the early, in the opening pages of Becoming a Visible Man, Jameson Green narrates a scene of him standing in front of a group of eager young medical students. And I think this will connect to um, a lot of what we were talking about in the chat during the last panel about the sort of like complexities of, of medicalization in particular. He is providing one of his highly sought after transgender diversity trainings. Green remarks first on the demographics of the students that he addresses, which he calls a melange of ethnic backgrounds, ages, and life experiences, quote, different from the much more homogenous group with whom I attended college in the late 60s. How much richer education can be today, he muses, with so many diverse viewpoints at hand. Green then offers a few pages in a sort of mock dialogical form of his back and forth with a medical student audience. So he's like bringing up questions and he's like, a student raised their hand and they asked this. And I'm like, did they really, Jameson? Or did you just write that down? But maybe they did. I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, and he goes back and forth with some, this medical student audience rhetorically in order to explain some basic trans facts, which are actually intersex facts repurposed as proof of trans legitimacy. Did you know that some people have XXY chromosomes? Did you know that some people have indeterminate genitalia? And so on and so on. You've probably heard this before. He then moves on to his centerpiece metaphor that he uses to explain transness to a generation of doctors. Think of sex as the hardware and gender is the software. In between, there is an operating system that allows the software and hardware to give meaningful instructions to each other so they work together to accomplish tasks. And he says, think about that. Um, uh, to these future doctors, imagine what it would feel like to live with that discrepancy. Um, and I would imagine that a lot of people in this room have maybe thought about this before, so I'm not going to like pose it to you. Um, and it's a familiar analogy to trans nerds who hang out on the internet, and also to many of us. Um, and I think that I, I have a moment about this, but like, what is so funny to me about this analogy is that we are familiar with it, it feels cringe to us because we have heard it before. It is circulated as a commonplace. After promulgating his computer analogy, um, in which the correction of transsexualism must take place through a modification of hardware or software, or maybe by a tweak to the operating system, Green then pivots and he challenges students to think of sex and gender differences as variations, as natural diversity that occur with surprising frequency in human beings. So he's offering two key yet logically opposing metaphors of transsexualism, right? The high-tech technological Cartesian machine apparatus, and also the naturalistic and seemingly um, uh, power neutral div population diversity rhetoric that we also hear right, just as frequently. Green lays out his case for tra a transness that is precisely attuned to a historical moment in which he speaks. He's providing his reading audience with a sample of his professional speech for which he was paid quite handsomely as a professional consultant. And he also initiates his own readers along with these hypothetical medical students to the contemporary understanding of trans phenomena before they're permitted to read the memoir. Readers are now educated by the professional gender diversity educator himself, and then they can read the rest of his life story and therefore rendering his body as they read as either maybe just in need of a simple OS upgrade or maybe part of the sort of like general diversity of the multicultural 1990s or something in between, it's kind of unclear. 
This idea of gender as software and sex as hardware and the logical contradictions that emerge when this metaphor is asked to sit alongside diversity as an idea, they don't surprise me. These are like similar problems logically and politically um, to the all of the gender diversity trainings that I've had to sit through as an employee. So if you have had to do one of these, right, then you might have heard things like this before. Um, and I have also given speeches like this, right? Um, it is a very weird thing. You have to kind of explain what is this thing to a bunch of cis people who don't really care and are forced to be there. But the very fact that this type of speech is familiar is a sign of its institutionalization and that institutionalization is not inevitable. For the idea of sex as hardware and gender as software is already, as likely many of you know, not a good description of the binary between hardware and software. These are also not oppositional ideas. So it's just like, I went to the library in the kids section with my kid and um, I found this hilarious book about like computer science for middle schoolers. And it's like, here's hardware in the like yellow boxes and here's software in the blue boxes. And that's how you take selfies. So it's this idea that these things are like, you need both to do the thing. Um, also, I see that there's a whole like hackers track. I like I'll, I'll have to like come back to hackers. Um, and I, I think that this sort of like sex is hardware, gender is software analogy kind of is like the gingerbread person for computers, um, which is also a pretty bad description of the relationship between sex and gender. And furthermore, as anyone who has actually read Judith Butler instead of read something about Judith Butler will tell you, it is also not what critical theorists of gender and sexuality were contending during this historical period. It's the opposite, sorry, talk about the slide. Um, the sex is to hardware as gender is to software analogy is an incredibly historically specific um, and uh, culturally specific phenomenon that emerges during this period, not randomly, but because it is, an al it is aligned with an understanding of embodiment and technology that is specific to the 1990s and early 2000s in Silicon Valley and the white trans, white collar professionals that are getting paid to circulate ideas about transness. Um, and they're the people who are sort of teaching this gender schema to everyone else because they're part of very powerful institutions. Um, so sorry to put the gender red slide up there. Um, maybe I'll just skip to the next slide so you don't have to stare at it. While Green represents himself as a special guest, he is actually one of the mo people most responsible for creating and circulating this particular account of transness over the last 30 years. He's one of the most important people in trans policy over the last 30 years, from the HRC Business Council at the beginning of the Corporate Equality Index, all the way to being president of WPATH. And so he's, he's sort of responsible as much as anybody is responsible for perpetuating particular ideas about gender that can circulate, that go through those tubes, that are transmitted broadly and quickly across the United States and increasingly from the global north to the global south in a imperial formation that is not whole, but does exist. So that's kind of like a way to think like, this is a hegemonic European and Cartesian understanding of sex and gender that is adopted as a dominant strain of trans ontology, but that doesn't actually erase other formations. It just is the one that you can make the most money for telling people about. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff about the fetish of code and stuff. I might skip some of it because I don't know, I'd rather talk to y'all, um, but I want to go to, yeah, okay. So just as Green from his job at Bell learned how to translate electrical diagrams between engineers and linemen, and eventually how to position himself as someone who could communicate complex ideas across difference, we might also learn from Green how trans bodies were beginning to articulate themselves as different at the onset of the neoliberal moment, and at the same time, articulate trans people as particularly great at computers because our brain body difference is the same as a computer hardware problem that we're always trying to solve. We must be incredibly good technicians if we already have computer brains that are broken and we spend all of our time fixing them, right? So it was through the efforts of Silicon Valley-based diversity trainers like Green and others that IBM started to instantiate their um, trans inclusion policies, um, starting with things like gender identity and expression non-discrimination clauses, um, which uh, I'm sure have helped everyone a lot <laughs> all the time. Um, and so this is part of IBM's transition framework, which I like love, and I love the business case for transgender inclusion. And there's people who are writing about this too. I don't wanna like erase Dan Irving's work on this particular um, 
phenomenon. And there's like a long history of how this got made and it's gonna get remade in the future. It's very interesting if, if this is your special interest. Um, and big tech, like before anyone else in the Fortune 500 was doing it, was making this map. They're the sort of like originators of corporate transness, which now like I think General Motors will do it. But like, this is, this is the sort of like originary statement. And this type of instantiation of a type of transnormativity in big tech has transnational stakes. So imagine that, you know, like we are circulating these images as consultants, as people who are making money, as people who win or who are like embedded in these corporations and as people who work there, right? So once we have a trans inclusive policy, more trans people can work there without getting fired or harassed. They can get their surgery to pay for. Like, that's awesome. I like want people to be able to survive. Um, but what it does is to create a sense that big tech is pro-trans and that gets exported globally. And I have a real like set of problems with that exploitation. Um, the answer to sort of why there is maybe an over um, an over representation of trans people in tech is potentially not because our bodies are incredibly good at solving computer problems because they are themselves broker, broken computers, but because the people who worked in tech companies at San Francisco hired a few of us. And then those few of us did some trainings and they made some nonprofits and they set on boards until more of us were hired and they figured out how to get HRC to also trick their bosses into doing the same. Um, so here's like HRC's partnering with IBM to promote LGBT workplace equality across the Americas, which like I got some questions there. Um, there's a lot about supporting the journey, which I love. I love a journey to a global trans gender transition in the global workplace. I'm like not going to go into a deep close reading of this. I hope you share my skepticism. And if not, we can we can chat. Um, but I want to I want to end with just like a, a brief moment from I, what I think is sort of like the like climactic event of of these things. Um, for majority white transgender organizations, the one we tend to be embarrassed about a little bit in trans studies, the ones that kind of constitute the majority of the trans print archive, but that we don't wanna talk about because we're afraid that everyone will find out that white trans people historically found a lot of 501c3s um, rather than do the revolution. Um, those organizations felt that this was a kind of triumph, um, that we could be both our unique and different wild duck selves and not be fired. Um, that we could benefit from a type of racial status while also exhibiting our desires to be ourselves at work. In April 2004, International Business Machines won a Partners in Diversity Award from the International Foundation for Gender Education, IFGE. The award was presented at IFGE's 18th Annual International Foundation for Gender Education Conference, which took place that year in a mid-sized hotel conference room outside of Philadelphia. Um, a photograph in IFGE's semi-quarterly magazine, Trans Tapestry, shows some IBM, an IBM guy, <laughs> which I'll show you. Let me see. Oh yeah, I love this picture. Um, uh, Brad Salovich, who is IBM's GLBT diversity program manager, holding a small wood plaque next to the IFGE chairperson, Hawk Stone. To Stone's left is Cynthia Neff, then a vice president of human resources. To Salovich's right is Dana, um, who I'm not going to talk about because I'm protecting her privacy, but... Um, like it is something that I, I'm talking to her a lot. Um, all, all four, the three IBMers and the nonprofit chairperson appear to be white and all are smiling. Dana wears a light pink business suit with gold buttons. And you can also see that the gay men's chorus performed. There was a drag queen in an earnestly patriotic red, white, and blue red Betsy Ross costume. And there was a reading from Kate Bornstein. And um, my summary of this image and this sort of event is that it might be the whitest diversity award presentation of all time. The work that we have in front of us is not just to valorize the work of resistance and the work that difference does, or else we risk being integrated as so seemingly special wild ducks. The more we can reckon with a trans history that doesn't look like what we think it's supposed to look like, that doesn't appear where it's supposed to, that sometimes wears hard hats and sometimes wears business casual pantsuits, um, the more we'll be able to account for and truly reckon with what must happen before trans liberation as part of an anti-racist and big tech abolitionist horizon can actually occur. We have to admit that not all trans history is y'all better quiet down. It's also partners in diversity. And we have to take seriously that whiteness has long been what Anna Lauren Hoffman, Nikki Stevens, and Sarah Florini have called 
the unremarked optimism within the tech sector. Thank you. That's the way it's the lone clap. I'll get close to my mic. Um, and uh, there we get the, the, the clap emojis coming out. Um, Dr. Adair, that was, uh, that was incredible. It was amazing. I, uh, I, I don't think I've actually, I know they were bad jokes, but like I, I haven't actually laughed that much out loud alone in my basement uh, during an academic talk in a very long time. Um, and so, uh, so, so thank you for that. And uh, folks that have questions, go ahead and throw them in the q &A. We've got a few minutes here before we move on to the next panel. Um, but I, I wanna start, I wanna go back to, uh, and I, apologies to, to, to those in the audience that were horrified, but I wanna go back to the hardware software analogy of the gender bread uh, and, and, the, and the gender bread side. It, it, uh, it reminds me and, and shout out to Nikki, uh, Stevens uh, again for for sort of pointing, you know, impressing this point on me. But it it, it also echoes this 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 movement this move that happens in the 1970s where we are start to where we are able to start to conceive of sort of data as well as like a as a thing that is separable and 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 manipulable uh, relative to the to the underlying uh, sort of material storage of of digital data right so that we can we can we can one of these things then becomes sort of dis they, we, we're able to disambiguate them one of these things becomes surface and manipulable and then one of these other things becomes real and uh, and and the real substrate um, and, and I'm always reminded of like the, the terrible, I mean, the show is awesome, Halt and Catch Fire, but the terrible phrase that they always come back to is like, like those, 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 those software, those programmers, they're not close to the metal, right? Like there's this idea in that, sh that there's this nostalgic idea in that show that like being close to the metal uh, offers you some, some kind of access to realness uh, or, or authenticity. And beyond the sort of, beyond the sort of the, 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 the gender bread, uh, uh, analogy, I'm wondering if you can just kind of speculate on some of the ways that you see that duality, that, that disambiguation uh, manifesting in, in other discourses or conversations around uh, technology development and design uh, and, and production today, uh, because it seems to be one of those things that just like that, that dogs us um, and, um, and is really hard to shake. Yeah, I'm like, my brain is a little bit fried. So um, I might answer part of that question and might not do another part of it. Um, a lot of what I'm really interested in, in the sort of larger project is understanding the ways in which the sort of like realness versus um, some sort of like ethereal binary gets cemented and solidified in tech during this time, but also in trans studies during this time. So we trace, um, a lot of trans studies. If you're like me and you've been in the field for 12 years, um, you might have gone to a conference that was like the post post transsexual conference um, about the um, Sandy Stones like really kind of awesome like um, Empire Strikes Back essay from 1992, and you might have understood that like that essay has been incorporated into the field itself at the moment of its institutionalization as sort of like one of the beginning, the sort of er texts, the like degree zero of trans studies. And a lot of what that essay is doing is using Donna Haraway's ideas about cyborg feminism to try to ask questions about brains and bodies and where is the material. And we're not these like eco-feminists who are into essentialism and like into spiritualism. Like we're not all like tarot card feminists. We're like hardcore materialists, socialists over here, right? But at the same time, Sandy's really, really interested in her professional work at thinking about what it means to take our bodies away from ourselves. Like, where are we? Like, if we can get onto a computer and we can fly away from our subjectivity, is that the future? Is that where we're all going? Like that idea about somatechnics and technology and the idea that we can take our brains away from our bodies um, is really, really embedded in the early history of the field. There's an interview with Susan Stryker that Susan Stryker did with Sandy Stone that was printed in Wired Magazine in 1995. It's all about like how dope it is that we can all be on computers and like be anybody we want. And like Kate Bornstein writes a novel about how dope it is that we can be on computers and be anybody we want. Um, and at the same time, if you were in a women's studies class in like 1995, 
you would also be assigned to watch Paris is Burning. And you would be assigned to think of trans of color subjects as, I, as having some kind of unique perspective on the real, right? Like the idea of realness, but also, wow, the real, there's some kind of like real gritty materialist trans of color life out there. And we as like college students in gender women's studies classes are supposed to experience that by watching Paris is Burning. Like that's an experience that I had of that in undergrad. So we have, on the one hand, a trans genealogy, a way that we understand transness in the academy as like, wow, trans women of color have had a really hard time. Here's this documentary, by the way, made by a white woman that's supposed to represent that to you as undergraduate students. And on the other hand, wow, trans people are these like high tech, cool, like, you know, cyber surfers who are like out there bringing in their new identities and doing like cool sex on the internet. Like both of those things are happening during the same period. Um, and so I think that one of the ways that this gets articulated is like a real bait and switch with trans studies where like trans studies is trying to articulate both of those, like both like we have this genealogy that comes from cyborg feminisms from the sort of 1980s and a sort of like materialist critique of an earlier moment of bioessentialism. And also we think that um, real trans revolution started with trans women of color and doing like you know, throwing bricks at cops and shit, right? I don't think we can actually have both. I think they're actually incommensurate. And I think it tells a larger story about um, tech in particular being the avenue through which we ourselves as trans academics are also trying to imagine that we have a special relationship to the future that is disarticulated from our racial implication in the nation state. So like, that was a really long answer to that. I don't know if it helped. It's like super late. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like figuring it out, but like, like we think of ourselves as having unique relationships to technology too, even when we're doing critical practices. And that hour tends to be white trans academics who are taking credit for trans women of color revolutionaries at the same time as we're like, yo, look at our dope ability to like code and stuff in the nineties. I'm gonna get to the, some audience questions. There's, there's a, there, that, that was great, thank you. There was a lot, there's a lot in there I wanna, uh, I wanna talk about, but I, I'll, uh, I'll pull up, we have, um, you know, uh, one sort of uh, maybe harder question, but then uh, and then one easier question. And so, so uh, can you talk a little bit more about the sort of the the, the tensions or or harms or, or even maybe violences we might say um, that are uh, that that continue to be sort of smuggled in under the the kind of the rubric of inclusion um and uh and and you're somebody who who you you even confess in the gender red slide as well as like i've used this like I, i'll use it to explain it right and i i know i joked about like trans people are only only appear in in the literature when we're in an airport body scanner but like if I want to get traction in a room full of like so surveillance studies people, I'll use the airport body scanner because like they're, they're just gonna like it's gonna it's gonna work and uh, and uh, no matter how tired I am of it and um, and so that to me reads as akin to to or or, or parallel to what folks that are working in industry, uh, working in particular companies who are also trying to like navigate this, this tension between um, what the what inclusion can get you and the, and the rhetoric and discourse of inclusion can get you. Um, but what you, what you are, are, I don't wanna say sacrificing, but like but what, you're, what you're conceding by doing that. Yeah, um, the answer to this question comes directly from a, trans tech worker who I'm not going to name, um, but who quit uh, working for IBM after I think three years. And she basically said to me, you could not pay me enough to go back to IBM. And that is because she was a ticket ripper. She was somebody who was basically fielding IT calls all the time. Like, you know, my, my computer won't turn on, what do I do? And she has to say, well, did you plug it in? And that's her job, right? And she was working in a warehouse. She was working for 18 hours a day sometimes. She was being disrespected by her colleagues. She also had to watch PowerPoints about how IBM does trans inclusion, right? And like the, the real problem here <laughs> is that trans inclusion benefits some people and therefore it is meant to stand in for benefiting all the people. I, did, I think that's just like a sort of simple answer, but you know, when I interviewed this woman, she had just like, not just quit her job at IBM, but moved out of the town where she had been living. 
Um, and she had basically been like, I have trauma from how badly I was treated by customers, by managers, by my coworkers. And it, that is a, an amount of trauma that like being trans is like one part of. It was one part of her story of the trauma of doing that job. And it sounded like a terrible job. And I was like, I have a writing fellowship to write down your story. I'm just like sitting in my house in my slippers. Like we are doing different types of trans work right now. And my trans work signifies as trans work. It is valorized as trans work. And it is understood as brain labor, right? And you're doing the labor of sitting down at a tiny desk, fielding transphobia, and also trying to answer questions from people who yell at you on the phone. So I, did, I think that there's like, yeah. A way that when we think about trans workers, like who's doing trans inclusion, we're a lot of times imagining programmers. Like, yeah, I want people who work as programmers or as engineers or as project managers to like not have a fucking terrible time. But I don't want the fact that they might have a better time if you do certain things to obfuscate the fact that like who is gonna who is really gonna benefit from the pronouns in the bio. And I'm I'm like not yeah. trying to be an asshole about that, but like I'm really not trying to be like oh, like straight up like Mark's yeah. bro, but like. I'm, I'm talking to people who are like, this does not matter to me. I had to do the PowerPoint yeah. on the clock and it sucked. Like that was, yeah. And also people are talking about academia. There's a line I cut from the talk that was like, by the way, academia is the same. This whole talk is a subtweet of academia because it's hard to get a job just subtweeting academia, but this is another place. Yeah. yeah. Guys, I, I, got, I have to say this because I, I, I was working in my head that we had until the hour and we, we don't, we are extra over time. And that's, that, that's my fault. One other question somebody had was like, what, what what have you got out that people can cite and read on this or when when is stuff coming out drop it in the chat for us please um and i want everyone else to to join me again uh in thanking uh dr adara for sharing this this work with us and bringing us together around this work um uh I'm so grateful for your time thank you thank you thank you and now i'm going to turn it over to uh to oliver who's going to take us into the second panel um at, with 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 apologies uh on my bad for eating a couple minutes in so thank you thanks so much anna and thank you Cass, for the amazing keynote i think that was really incredible um let me just share my screen Okay, and I'm hoping you're seeing my screen, but not my notes right now. Is that correct? Okay, awesome. So yeah, welcome to the last panel of the day. And thank you all for you know sticking with us throughout the afternoon. I think um, this has been such an amazing event. Um, it's really incredible to see so many people here and to see that we're building this community around trans tech research. Another thing I think is really exciting here is this way that this has been combining um, applied trans studies and digital studies, critical data studies, et cetera, by bringing together so many different disciplines. So here, just in this last panel, for instance, we have scholars with backgrounds and current um, orientations in communication, human computer interaction, computer science, gender studies, information, media studies, digital humanities, Etc. So I think it's just incredible that we're able to bring this many different disciplines together. And I think we kind of need to to get at some of these questions. Um, so, and I want to just um, foreground this slide by saying, like, <laughs> I definitely feel a little bit called out by Cass on some of these particular points, but um, I still think we can see the truth in some of these and think about you know, new ways to think about some of these things, um, thinking about like current technologies and current um, ways that we're thinking about technology. So um, one of the main things I was thinking about in bringing together this amazing group of panelists here in this last session is considering the ways that technology helps us imagine um, new possibilities for trans people and communities, uh, but also at the same time, how considering and centering trans experiences helps us to imagine new possibilities for technology. And so I think that all of the panelists here are doing really exciting work thinking about not only the current state of trans technology, but also how the past informs where we are now and also what might come in the future. Um, and this is the order that I, I'm going to ask people to do their short intro talks in, just um, for your reference. So here we're going to have some amazing work on histories of trans technologies, like Whit Powell's work on 
queer and trans histories of video games and Avery Dame Griff's historical research about the transgender internet. We also have exciting work about the current state of trans uses of technology, things like Moya Bailey's research about online trans advocacy and how it can help to transform misogynoir. Uh, Alex Ahmed's work uh, designing technology for voice training and collaboration with trans communities and T. Uh, Chuan Romani's work examining um, how tech in combination with storytelling can assist people in transition journeys. Um, and I think all of these panelists are also pointing to what kinds of technological futures might be possible and what we want for trans technology moving forward. Because I think we all realize there are a lot of different potential dystopian paths, but there are also hopeful trans tech futures as well. Um, and so we'll be hearing a brief five minute talk from each panelist about their work. Um, and then we'll go into a discussion with, um, I have some questions prepared, but we'll also hear some questions from the audience. So um, please feel free to enter questions that you would like to hear answers from our panelists. And um, with that said, I'm gonna do a quick introduction of Whit Pow, who will start us off. So uh, Whitney Whit Pow is an assistant professor in the Department of Media, Culture, and Communication at New York University. Pow's research focuses on queer and trans histories of video games, glitches, software, and computational media. Their current book project is locating transgender video game designers and programmers in histories of early software and hardware development, uh, looking at the intersection of queer and trans medical history, surveillance, and policy with computer and video game history. Thanks so much for that introduction, Oliver. And I just wanted to thank everyone for organizing this amazing, amazing event. This is just stellar and has been wonderful to, to kind of um, learn and sit through this whole afternoon. So thank you. Um, I'm going to screen share. We'll see if this works. Um, does that look, is that working? Oh, wait, wait, hold on a second. Um, let's do share. Is this visible? Um, I just wanted to begin with a land acknowledgement. Um, I acknowledge that I'm presenting on the unceded homeland of Lenape people, and I recognize the continued importance of this land for Lenape nations past and present. Um, so for this uh, kind of like, um, a, like five minute talk, I wanted to kind of begin with the title. There aren't any maybes, only zeros and ones toward a trans video game and software history. And um, importantly, there aren't any maybes, only zeros and ones is an actual quote from a game designer that I kind of look at in, and her history and interest in network online games. And so in a lot of the research that I do, I, I'm kind of looking toward the way that video game history has been kind of constructed around modes of histo history and historiography that are very reliant on data and documents and things that have been saved in archives. And I'm trying to kind of look through, for instance, like the way certain things are saved within these institutions and certain, certain things are lost within these institutions as well, and how we can kind of rethink the way we do history and what we think of as evidence with regard to writing histories in which uh, trans people and trans histories can sometimes be elided or eliminated from archives. Um, so I wanted to begin with uh, Danielle Buntenberry. Um, she is a game designer who actually created one of the first ever networked online games that connected uh, multiple computers through an online connection. And interestingly enough in video game history um, and networked game history, she's not mentioned um, uh, very frequently at all, but she is like the, one of the most prominent game designers of this history. Um, and I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about methods here since I am actually approaching my methods for thinking about trans video game and software history through a medical archive. And so to give you some context, um, I visited the Strong National Museum of Play in Rochester, New York, and I went through the archive, uh, one of the, and then I realized as I was visiting that um, Danielle Bunton Berry's papers were in this archive. And uh, it's the only complete collection devoted to one trans game designer that I've ever seen. And uh, what was interesting is that, and this is something I, I kind of, you know, talk about with various um, historical and archival institutions too, like her documents 
include her name as a parenthetical. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, instances where her dead name shows up constantly throughout the papers. And I realized it was actually because of the fact, and this is like off the record too, of the fact that um, her archive was donated by family and the family were donated the documents with a stipulation that her, uh, not, her, her not name was used as the primary name for this archive. So throughout this archive, as I was looking through it, I, I felt this strong sense of illusion and that there were things missing, things that were kind of, uh, it felt like the shape of her, her, her presence as a trans person was completely eliminated from this archive. And um, some of the things that I kind of encountered within this archive include uh, these folders, which were like very strange to flip through with regard to biograph biographical documentation, seeing institutional documents holding her in a way that I did not see many of the other uh, documents in the archive, including like, you know, uh, design documents and, and sort of business documents holding this information. And interestingly enough, there was a folder titled Post-Operation Notes to Medical Staff, October to November 1995. And um, one of the important parts of this research is that uh, Danny Buntenberry, she actually passed away in 1998. So what does it mean to write a trans history of technology and games when the people aren't here is, is one question that I'm asking. And within this uh, folder, uh, what I found very striking is that it actually doesn't contain the sort of uh, institutional documentation that we'd, we'd think about with regard to um, post-operation notes. Instead, it actually contains these lined, empty, uh, sort of like sign-in sheets from the North Carolina Baptist Hospitals Incorporated in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And these are all like basically used as lined notebook paper of her communicating her personal ex lived experience of being in a hospital uh, due to a gender affirming surgery, and but she was by herself. So she's literally using a, a type of media that was designed to keep and hold data and information and using it to record her own experiences and using it to communicate to the people who are supposedly caring for her within this institutional space. So I kind of think about this, um, this archive and these documents as kind of their own alternative methodology, thinking about history and about medical history in relationship to this idea of the past, about what we know, what about evidence, with regard to her rethinking the idea of a data sheet as being an element for connection and movement toward other people. Um, and I realize I'm kind of coming close to time, so I just wanted to include a couple more slides of her, uh, her games, including uh, Computer Quarterback in 1981, which was actually did not have a single player mode. It was all multiplayer. Um, and then she was, she was forced to include a single player mode later on. So that kind of tells you about her thinking about this digital sociality of computing and computers alongside some of the documents I was looking at in the archive as well as uh, Robot Rascals itself, which is a game that uses playing cards and things that are outside of the computer system for people to play uh, and engage with each other outside of the sort of binary um, game system within the computer itself. Um, so just thinking through digital sociality through this history and through this connection to the medical archive. All right, thank you very much. Amazing talk. Thank you, Whit. Um, so up next, we're going to have Avery Dame Griff. Avery Dame Griff is an assistant professor in the career track in digital technology and culture at Washington State University Pullman. He also founded and is a primary curator of the Queer Digital History Project, which is an independent community history project cataloging and archiving pre-2010 LGBTQ spaces online. Um, he has a book coming out uh, soon on NYU Press called The Two Revolutions, A History of the Transgender Internet, which will track how the internet transformed transgender political organizing from the 1980s to the contemporary moment. Thanks so much. Let me get to, 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 to practice with this. I've done it a week. Right, yeah, so thank you very much uh, for that intro. So I guess I've got all my stuff um, up here. So uh, what I was gonna essentially kind of break it out, break this down to talk to two portions, kind of the project that tasted most of my time that sort of has become the thing I do a lot of, which is a queer digital history project. And so this is sort of, if you ever find me at conferences when we meet in person, I have stickers. <laughs> so this is my sticker. 
Um, so the Queer Digital History Project uh, sort of came out of, I had done my book, the, the work that goes in the book um, came from my dissertation. And I realized as I was doing it, because I was looking at the history of some of this stuff, I had all this information. I didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, I found I was teaching it to students. I didn't have a way for them to access it. So that's kind of how I got the idea to have a digital history project, because it didn't feel like this was history that was being preserved. Um, so what the project itself covers, and so this is obviously a screenshot, and um, I will, when I'm done, I'll throw in a link to it in chat, is a bunch of different stuff. Um, I have a catalog of essentially, so it's not trans specific, it's sort of, I use queer inclusively, also alternate, also sometimes LGBTQ, but essentially it's inclusive of a variety of different um, groups. So I have a community catalog that is just kind of about tracking uh, information and references and primary documentation of queer groups, a lot of them bulletin boards from the 80s and 90s. Um, and to kind of just to keep track of that stuff, to have a historical record, because often these sites resisted archiving due to the nature of a BBS, which were always kind of fragile. Uh, Kevin Driscoll, who basically has written the historical book on BBSs that's coming out in a couple months, he calls, he says they sort of have an anti-memory system and he's not wrong. Um, and they have an archive of primary documents, some of which are scraped from existing archives, a couple of which are donated. I'll talk about one of those in a sec. Um, that, yeah, they're just kind of documents from this era. Some of them are technical. Some of them are honestly like, they're just lists of boards or they're the sign of documentation to access some of them. Um, it's just stuff I found and sort of collected and organized. Um, I also have an archive created using the tool Bookworm. This was part of a project I did while I was a dissertation fellow at Myth that is a, a archive of trans Usenet groups um, that allows uh, folks to essentially do a lot in terms of, kind of being able to explore these different news groups uh, from this period using what the internet archive holds. Um, I also have a couple of maps, which will be on the next slide, of uh, TGNet, which was the first international trans-specific BBS network. It ran off essentially the same infrastructure as FidoNet. Um, and it ran out of a BBS out of uh, Monterey Bay, California called Feminet. And so it was sort of the first international network of this stuff. Uh, and the last kind of major thing is I also have a kind of research guide I built for folks who are really interested in doing web history and queer web history in particular. Um, that uh, it said to if this is what you're interested in, here are some good primary documents. Here are some resources I've used. Uh, so this is all kind of stuff to make this a little more accessible to folks. Um, and so otherwise, like I said, I have some examples um, of stuff. So like right here, this is uh, hopefully, if press lets me keep it, um, a figure of this is the very first ad for the very first um, trans bulletin board, GenderNet. It, this is an ad from Tapestry, and I want to say 88. Um, but yeah, so some of it is archiving stuff like that. Or this is a screenshot of uh, the map I did of the TGNet BBS, which actually came from when I was at uh, the Labity Collection. Uh, they happened to republish the list in Petticoat Junction, one of the newsletters from the 80s. And so I pulled, I made sure you got a copy of that. I made that until I could, again, like I said, an interactive map. Um, and then there's like other stuff such as, um, I actually are speaking of folks what has worked with, uh, reach out to Jamie Faye Fenton to get a copy of um, TG Forum. They put the first version of the website on CD to sell it. So like got copies of that. Um, so basically it's just like to collect all of this stuff um, so that it's there and it's accessible and folks can use it. Um, and the last thing this project I've very recently started um, and hopefully to unveil this year now that I miraculously have interns for the first time ever, um, I've started to do oral histories with queer folks who are active during the 80s and 90s about that experience, specifically about often about the kind of specific forums they were involved in. Uh, so the most recent one I did was with Caleb Hunt and Mary Gray, who were both early moderators for SOAP Support Youth LGB, which was a moderated LGBT um, Usenet news group to talk about that experience and where it came from um, and how that led into their own work. Uh, and so that's something, fortunately, I will actually, I'm in talks with, if it works out, fingers crossed, um, I will have those on the website and the Computer History Museum will also be duplicating those and holding copies of those as well. 
Uh, so that's sort of all like the big kind of the ongoing work I do. And then the book itself, I thought the easiest way I just have a chapter outline. It sort of walks through each of the major systems to understand how the internet transforms it. Because the title comes from this article, Stephanie Rose, who I don't know if that's a real name or it was a pseudonym, writes in Chrysalis, the new, um, the magazine of IGES, Dallas Denny's organization in 91, which she says, we're undergoing two revolutions at this moment. One is a revolution about the idea of the concept of transgender as a collective identity instead of this term gender community that had been used throughout the eighties. So we have this one way of understanding, it's a revolution of how we think of ourselves and begin to engage in collective political activism. And the other, she says, is the computer revolution. And so in this case, she's also writing an instructional um, article about how to access BBSs. Um, so I get to see that there's these two revolutions happening. So I talk about how these things are intertwined and they're connected to changing attitudes toward the computer within American life. Because we're, this is also a period of time we're moving from the microcomputer is somewhat specialized. And it's really centered on folks who work with it um, through to the computer essentially becoming like a home appliance. Every middle-class home has one. It's no more exciting than a refrigerator. So this is essentially, and trans folks are part of that history, you know? And so it's working through each of the kind of major platforms. So the first, the bulletin board system and its impact on organizing, um, the importance of these commercial platform spaces like AOL in particular. Uh, so say, fortunately, um, these are both screenshots that were donated for publication um, by Gwen Smith. Um, this is some of the only documentation of the transgender community forum. You know, and then for youth, for chapter three, talking about Usenet, the importance of Usenet to the evolution of the term cisgender, which is primarily until the early 2000s used only on Usenet. I mean, why that matters, talking about the role of the World Wide Web, because uh, I, I want to kind of keep in time. And then at the last part, the last thing is talking about the way in which the internet also allows for a generation change within the community with the idea of transgender use and youth as a thing that can exist can actually happen. It can happen because of the internet, because of the way it changes how youth can communicate with each other. Um, and so this, the final chapter is look, taking on the system, you're like, okay, well, what does that matter to the present? And how does everything folks fought for throughout these first five chapters on the internet, how are the particular nature of semantic search and then increasing emphasis on modularity in identity, how is it actually taking some of these this stuff and kind of effectively without us meaning to, using that technology to roll back the gains that were made throughout this period. Um, so that's it, like I said, I don't wanna take up too uh, much time, but so I'm happy to later answer questions about that, but that is the book. Hopefully in a couple of years, you will be seeing it on your bookshelves. Amazing, thank you so much, Avery. Um, we're gonna have Moya Bailey up next. Uh, Moya Bailey is an associate professor in the School of Communication at Northwestern University. Her work focuses on marginalized groups use of digital media to promote social justice and she's interested in how race, gender, and sexuality are represented in media and medicine. Uh, she's the digital alchemist for the Octavia E. Butler Legacy Network, the board president of Allied Media Projects, and she has two books um, one is hashtag activism, networks of race and gender justice, and then um, also misogynoir transformed black women's digital resistance. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, I want to start with a land acknowledgement and also just thanks for all of you for you know sticking with us for the last panel. I'm joining you from the traditional unceded homelands of the Council of the Three Fires the Ojibwe, the Ottawa, and the Potawatomi nations. And I was really moved by a non-land acknowledgement in which indigenous elders made clear that land acknowledgements are not enough and that they can sometimes be used to help white supremacy relax. So I'm not interested in helping white supremacy relax, but I do think when we have to move to the digital uh, because of these pandemic times, it's important not to forget that the hardware that runs all over Turtle Island that connects us to our digital devices and also the minerals that that hardware is made from is extracted from stolen land and mined by exploited people around the world. 
So even as we're doing our digital work, trying to make sure that we are keeping that in mind. I am gonna read just a, a bit from my book, uh, Massage Noir Transformed Black Women's Digital Resistance. And I've been thinking a lot about language. So I, Jim Jack's presentation in the first half really has primed a lot of my thoughts around how we talk about who we mean in the digital. And for me, that really came down to who people imagine Black women to be and the sort of assumptions that, that are part of that. So I struggled to come up with language that fully captured who was engaged with the transformation of massage noir. The term Black women is often assumed to mean straight and cis, with queer and trans Black women identified explicitly because of this normative assumption. Additionally, the term Black women is not inclusive of non-binary, agender, and gender variant Black folks whose experiences of massage noir are intimately connected with the misgendering of them. I struggle to reconcile my use of a term that is central to my definition of massage noir, yet excludes some of the people most invested in its transformation. For those of us on the margins of Black womanhood, woman is not what we name ourselves, even as massage noir colors our experiences of the world. So it is often those of us in the shadow of Black women TM who are the most engaged in media projects that transform massage noir. As we in the shadows are already limited by the frame of Black womanhood, we become some of massage noir's most vociferous opponents because it further diminishes our already limited light. When a hetero and cis normative understanding of Black women is used, it obscures the reality of those of us in the shade. So I experimented with several different terms to figure out uh, what I would use uh, to talk about who is interpolated by massage noir, who experiences that. And one of the terms that I thought about was the term non-men, which centers men as it attempts to define those who are not. Non-men is used online as a catch-all term, but its use recreates the exact erasure it wants to undo. Um, there's also women X seems a useful interlocutor, but it has its roots in pre-colonial indigenous languages and contemporary decolonial lingual practices. And the X in women X intervenes in the racist colonial histories of English and Spanish, while also attempting to solve the problem of genders beyond the man woman binary. And that's a lot of word for the letter X to do, but it still doesn't really account for uh, gender non-binary, agender people being readily apparent within those communities. So ultimately I decided that the best way to do this was to actually write out uh, black non-binary, agender and gender variant folks when it's necessary to prevent the continued conflation and erasure of these members of our community. And so I challenge the readers of the book to every time that they see the word woman to think of queer and trans women first when they read the term black women. And when you read the term black feminist, which also appears in the text, do not assume that it is interchangeable with black women for as this text and others um, that I reference in it, not all black women are feminists and not all black feminists are women. And so this has really brought me to my current questions, which were the things that I sent out uh, to the group before. I am really trying to think about how young people are thinking about language as it relates to trans studies. So I've noticed something that is uh, happening in uh, the forums and digital platforms that we all use today. There is a move away from assigned female at birth, assigned male at birth. And an important, I think, reason for that is people are trying to deal with the harm and um, the harm of that initial assignment in terms of how medical establishment continues to exert 
its force on our bodies. But then also people, I think, are trying to understand how do we then talk about or communicate um, in ways that some of the other panelists mentioned when it might be useful or when it might be necessary to make those distinctions known for reasons for medical health, et cetera. So trying to understand, again, when we use language and who's included, who gets hailed by certain language, and who uh, feels alienated by, by language as well. And I, I'll stop there. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Moya. Um, OK, we're going to have Alex Ahmed up next. Um, and she is a postdoc researcher at the Human Computer Interaction Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and Alex has been doing a lot of incredible research in the HCI space. Um, over the years, including um, she has introduced the concept of transcompetent interaction design and has been um, advocating for community-centered trans technology design. Thanks, Oliver, and hey, everybody. It's been really nice to be here and to be with so many fun and interesting and brilliant people. Um, I wanna share some recent work um, that I've done in collaboration with Anna Lauren Hoffman and a really brilliant PhD candidate named Levin Kim, both at the University of Washington. And what we did was we analyzed voice training apps that are designed and marketed specifically to trans people. And I wanna share those apps with you um, to walk you through them, talk you through them. And the goal of all this is not really to point out flaws in particular apps, but rather to understand how the apps are portraying gender and transition and the effects they might have not just on individual trans users, but also broadly what ideologies are being peddled and perpetuated through these apps on a much broader scale. So I'll start with an app called Eva, which is a pretty um, visible trans voice training app um, that's available on both uh, the Google Play Store and the App Store, uh, the Apple App Store. And it has two versions. One of them is for trans women, so that's this one. And the other one is for trans men, and that's this one. So I think the really low hanging fruit to look at here is like visually, aesthetically what's going on. Um, and I, we noted that these are pretty obviously well off people. They're on vacation, it seems like. This person who um, appears to be a white woman is gazing wistfully out on a beach, um, is wearing a, a long flowing dress. Um, and on the trans men version of the app, um, the person highlighted here is um, wearing a really sharp suit with like a gold uh, tie or shirt and for some reason a fedora. Um, and aside from this relatively obvious portrayal of like ideal masculinities and femininities being white, upper class, oriented around consumerism and leisure and they're normatively presenting, all that stuff has been argued many times, notably by in the realm of voice by a trans linguist named Lal Zimmon, whose work is really incredible. Um, but I also wanna go deeper into what the app is saying to users and what it allows them to do, and also what it allows them not to do. Um, so one thing we found um, is that these apps um, really highlight and elevate the authority uh, and experience of the trans speech therapists that have designed them. So in this case, Eva is created by a speech therapist named Kathy Perez, and we can learn a lot about her. It just goes on and on. <laughs> um, and we're kind of like, as we uh, looked at these apps, we're kind of struck, at least I was struck by the fact that we see their pictures. And I, for the life of me, could not remember or think of any apps that I've used that feature the creator of the app so prominently. Um, and so far in these apps is even showing videos of them explaining things to us. So this is another app called Cristela Voice Up made by um, the team of speech therapist Cristela Antoni. And at the very top, very prominently, we see her face and we get to know, we get to figure out the answer to the question, how she can help me find my feminine voice. I wanna play a little bit of it just to show you. voice. For over 20 years, I've been helping transgender individuals modify their voices using the Antony M2F and F2M voice change models. 
voice modification is okay so it, it that goes a while so but i want what i want to highlight is <laughs> i paused it on a funny part um how her not just her experience and her clinical chops and her experience are all um reasons why we should pay attention to her and enlist her as our gender ambassador so that we could become women um it's uh also the fact that we can see her and her her like aesthetic um choices and her manner of dress and all of these things are things that we are going to emulate and copy throughout the app's um, pedagogical uh, courses. Um, on the other hand, um, in addition to the authority of um, her as a clinician, there's also an appeal to the authority of um, just technical like measurement and quantitative metrics that are um, repeatedly um, uh, gathered um, through exercises and analysis. And I wanna show what that looks like too, um, because I find that, and I'll just start um, a recording of, I'll just start a recording of myself using these apps. Um, so this one is asking me to uh, speak into the microphone of the app and it's going to um, analyze my voice as it's doing so. And, I'll do it again for a little bit and then stop. Do, 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 do. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. So for these, uh, and I'm thinking of um, the presentation, um, Jack Husking's presentation from the very beginning about data visualization and transness, because these data visualizations are decidedly not um, kind of opening up the space of data visualization. It's very much using these um, tried it sort of uh, very prominent design paradigms of graphs and charts to analyze uh, my voice in terms of the percentage of time as I was speaking just now that my voice was in a masculine range, a feminine range, and what they call a neutral range. And they're showing this using a donut chart of blue, pink, and white, where white is neutral, uh, pink is feminine and blue is masculine. And I think that immediately I'm seeing that this data visualization is evoking a certain concept of gender as a discrete category, um, rather than a sort of continuous spectrum or anything like that. But what, what I think is interesting is that even apps made by trans people do this exact same thing. So I want to show you another one called Voice Pitch Analyzer. And this is one that it's really bare bones, just about data. Like there's no pedagogical tools, no clinician um, who's displaying themselves to you. Rather, this is just having me read a passage from the picture of Dorian Gray, which is not an easy thing to read actually. And after uh, I read this passage, I hit stop and it's gonna show me my voice um, on, a, on a chart that covers a, what they call a male range, female range and androgynous range. And it's also going to show me how my voice fluctuated over time. And it's also going to tell me that my range sounds mostly male, pretty blunt. But it's interesting to me that data visualizations, regardless of the creators of the apps, trans, cis, whatever, like they are appealing to this um, objective techno scientific measurement. And I'll end, I'll end with this in that, like, over the, all of these apps, we found that they promoted the idea of transition as this one-way event that occurs completely outside the view of society. And the reason we came to this conclusion was that unlike a lot of apps, these are totally self-contained. They don't connect to any other app you have on your phone. You can't share data. You can't um, associate it with any social profile, which in a lot of ways makes sense and could appeal to a lot of concerns that trans people might have about privacy. But at the same time, I think that it, they seem to me to be that these apps are places you go to contain and correct any messiness or um, in-betweenness about your voice. And this is connected a lot to the, the trans theorist Aaron Azura, who calls this gendered in indeterminacy, um, that I think these apps are encouraging people to, I guess, think of themselves in particular ways.
Um, and it all connects, I think, also to a narrative of transition as something that occurs in the, in the individual that can be tracked through data. And that occurs, I guess, in a way that, and this is something that I've um, been inspired by through this um, writer and theorist named, named uh, Jules Duane Gleason, who had a piece in Transgender Marxism, which is a recent book that I really encourage folks to check out in that she conceives of this individual atomized narrative of transition as really missing out on the more communal and collective aspects of transness and transition and gender in that it casts our lives as a really like individual internal struggle rather than a collective political struggle and all the things that we could do collectively to transform society like I don't know overthrow capitalism and hierarchies and all this stuff but I don't know that's just the thought um I'm going over time so I'll stop Thank you so much, Alex. Um, that was really fascinating. I, in the study that I'm currently working on, I actually got the chance to interview some of these creators of technologies like this. So I'd love to um, chat with you more about that at some point if you're interested. Um, okay, so we have one more panelist, um, T. Chuan Romani, who is a PhD candidate um, at University of Notre Dame uh, studying uh, computer science. Their research interests are around ways that technology can better serve the trans community by making different forms of transition more accessible um, and how technology can challenge traditional gender transition narratives. And their dissertation is looking at these normative narratives and proposing design alternatives. Um, they're also interested in data-driven storytelling and sense-making in relation to decision-making processes. Thank you, Oliver. And also thank you, Alex, for talking about like normative like narratives, because that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about now. Um, so yeah, like Oliver said, my dissertation is about um, looking at these normative narratives and figuring out like how are we going to relate to them, you know, whether design could be a tool that we can be used to challenge these. So before I go on, so just to get us all on the same page about what I mean when I say like normative transition narratives. So um, these narratives might be familiar to many of us who are like, you know, going to transition or are familiar with it. But essentially, like if you just can see the image in this slide, like this is um, kind of implying that there's like a, a phase of time, which is like the past, and this past phase is like a tortured past. So everything is awful, you know, you're pre everything, you're pre transition. And then once you kind of move more to the right in the image, you're kind of coming into this like liminal present where you're kind of living in this like vague in between space, but you want to get out of this space as soon as possible and get to this like hopeful future, like this place where, you know, life is perfect because you're post everything, your dummy transition is completed and you're always gonna go from, you know, um, this from one phase to another in a discrete and linear uh, process. So this normative narrative assumes that, you know, every trans person wants to and also can have the ability to access medical transition. Um, this process is linear and discrete and no matter who you are, no matter what your gender, you wanna transition in the same way. So I'm going to talk a bit about my work in looking at these narratives. And um, so my one of the studies that I have done um, is looking at Discord in the trans community, actually, and the role uh, that these online communities have in like the decision making process in regards to gender transition. So in this work, I looked at um, not only decision making, but like the collective community support aspect of transition as well. So in this work, I use a technique called uh, Synchronous remote community, so art method using uh, platforms online, which is Facebook and Discord. So it was a series of uh, three days focus group with uh, participants. Everything was asynchronous. Um, even for like Discord, we didn't have any voice channels, but we simply asked them, you know, about asked the participants about the way that they approached you know, gender transition. And in our case, in the study, we focus on top surgery. And like things like planning, decision-making, logistics, and like the support system, both in-person and online. And so what I found from doing this study is that storytelling is really powerful and it has a large role in not only like the decision-making, so things like um, hearing about other people's, you know, process of going through surgery, the decisions that they made, and kind of what their results were like, um, what the process was like, but also 
it was also a means of like trans care. So as coined by like human Latino, like the way that we show up for each other. So things like, um, you know, for participants who were not able to currently access to parts of transition that they wanted, even being able to talk or hear stories from other people prompted a, even a means of like, <laughs> But they say um, they they call it I think secondhand gender euphoria in a way. So it's a means of like self care and caring for each other. And also from this study, um, I found that the research space itself can also be a supportive environment, um, especially for like the Discord um, groups. So in the screenshot here, the um, you can see that Discord allows different features like that enable people to support each other. So like one participant shared a meme like I don't want to be seen or be I don't want to see or be seen by straight people, and then the emoji that allows them to react it's a way of like you know saying hey I hear you like this is how I do as well so like this discord and like even other platforms have like affordances and features that um are designed maybe not intentionally but it's being used as a means of community support so another project I've done is looking at like Alex I was looking at um apps that are around uh, gender transition so here in this project I'm looking more about the trend uh, the temporality aspect of gender transition and how the current transition tracking apps look at and manage maybe like diff different ways of going through gender transition so I'm looking at when I say transition tracking apps I also mean things like you know quantifying, perhaps quantifying your transition in different ways, recording your transition, recording milestones, um, setting goals, things like this. So I'm just gonna walk through two apps real quick. Uh, so the first one is called Solid. So it's a transition tracking app that allows you to set goals and mark them as completed for your transition. So looking at the screenshot all the way to the left, um, you basically start off by you know, giving them your name and then you give them your pronoun. So based on the pronoun option that you give, so she, her, he, him, they, them also color coded um it will suggest different goals for your transition um so if you select she her it might say like goals that like be maybe be about you know building a more feminine wardrobe and for he him maybe the opposite um and once you select your goals you can see on the screen to the far right it will show you what goals you have currently and your progress towards the goals so you can see from the temporality aspect of it um you can see there's the um little progress bar in the bottom that you know subdivides your cate the category the each goal of your transition into different phases and each goal is represented by you know an equal amount of like progress in the slider and so once you're done you can actually complete four out of four goals and, and the slider will complete so in here like my takeaway from this is that the way that they frame transition is the discrete set of goals and once you reach the end you reach the end um, so another app I wanted to talk about is TransTrack. So this is also a transition tracking app, but it's more um, specific than Solid in the in in just the aspect that they track more of the physical changes. So here um, you can you know upload pictures of your face and your body at different parts of your transition. So with the assumption being you know if you start medically transition one way or another, you might be you might want to you know track your changes, compare where you are now to where you were before starting hormones or so on and so forth. Um, so that's the main feature. They also have a safety feature, actually. Um, so you can lock your information with the password, and then you can so you can input like a dummy password, and it will give you. You can see the the screen on the far right, where it's basically a safety screen. It will pretend to be a train tracking app instead of a trans tracking app. Um, so anyone who you don't want to see, um, you know, your information or your images, then you can protect your information like that. Um, so here, the way that that TransTrack looks at temporality is um, also as a reflection on the past, like, you know, com comparing where you are now to maybe look, thinking about where you were back then and, where, and how far you've come along. So that's uh, the work I've done before my dissertation proposal. So um, in right now, I'm working on looking more at these transition tracking apps and how um, people who currently use these uh, view these apps and how they might be used and their views in the, within the trans community. Um, I'm also looking at um, whether visualization could be something that can be used for you know supporting trans storytelling. So in this image, uh, in the 
the in the far right it's actually a design space that has been proposed for general timeline visualizations that can be um, you know linear or non-linear it can support different facets so i'm interested in the potentially looking at how visualization can interface with trans storytelling and sense making so that's all i have thank you Great, thank you so much, T. Um, this was so amazing to hear about all of the really exciting work that you all are doing. Um, and so I wanted to kind of talk about like, this panel is trying to bring together people who are doing work around digital technology, but also um, doing things around like uh, trans issues and gender and et cetera. Um, so I'd like to hear from everyone what unique and important insights you think that we can get to by combining these two topics of focus, like that we might not be able to if we were just considering trans issues or if we were just thinking about digital technologies. Um, so we can, I guess, go in the same order um, that you spoke today, if that works. Uh, so we'll start with Whit. My apologies, could you repeat that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Um, and if there's anyone else who would prefer to go first, that is totally fine as well. Um, but I was asking kind of what are the unique and important insights that we can get to for combining um, studying trans topics, but also studying um, digital technology? Like, um, and maybe you can talk about it kind of from your own perspective. Like, why was it important for you, for instance, to study um, you know, trans games histories? Well, thank you for that question, Oliver. Um, so one of the ways that I'm kind of looking at game studies is actually through, or at video games, actually through software studies. So one of the things I feel very strongly about, and one of the what things I love about video games is that they're visual. And so they are software that is designed to be visual. They usually have an interface of some kind. They have some sort of action that the user can control or do something with. But there's something really fascinating about this interplay between the idea of a visual digital art piece or a, a like interactive art piece and software, because software, as so many people have discussed, and also like, you know, in terms of computer history, software emulates uh, institutional thinking. Uh, software, I, I, I think of software and archives together as institutional sort of like interlocutors in terms of like, um, you know, uh, I love Ishil and Bembe and, uh, you know, the way that uh, he, he talks about um, things, you know, it's either inside or outside of the archive. It's also a binary in the same way that um, the digital and the way that like choice and all these other sorts of settings happen and are coded within video games as well. So what happens when we take this sort of biopolitical context of archives and institutions and institutional systems thinking that's in medical archives that's within uh, medical history, that's within institutional and governmental archives, what happens when we take that sort of like logic and we apply it to something like video games um, is something that I'm really interested in. And then when I put those two together, I realized that there's so much missing, you know, like the, the way that archives work, there's always things that are excluded. Archive functions as a file or a basket. There's always things that are excluded. It's necessarily a like, a, a, um, an excluding mechanism, it's a binary mechanism. So when we think about the sort of limitations of these institutional projects of memory and meaning and, uh, you know, uh, how, do we, how do we think about that in relationship to video games? Um, what can we think about with regard to the way video games function in terms of how they visually represent power systems in the way that their uh, interfaces function? Or maybe even in, in a separate project that, uh, as Avery kind of mentioned earlier too, Jamie Faye Fenton, who's worked uh, and done like the very first ever piece of glitch art, what does it mean when you dissolve an interface or a computer system visually? Um, so kind of looking at the in-betweenness and the outsides of an archive in relationship to game studies and technology studies has been a really big and important part of the, uh, the, the work that I'm doing on, on trans histories and historiographies of technology and games. Yeah, definitely. And I think that that ties in actually really well with Avery's work as well, like in thinking about um, for you, Avery, like how do trans experiences enable us to think about digital archiving differently? Yeah, I think also at uh, first off, I apologize. I, we have been quarantined with my kid for the past week, so I forget that she's like in the back. <laughs> so you may hear her. Um, I think she's currently 
shouting, she's trying to scare her, uh, scare my spouse. Um, but yeah, I think it definitely, this is sort of, you mentioned how we connect to this. I often think of the origin I'd story I tell of the project was um, coming in to uh, sort of starting basically grad school and reading a lot of the popular trans histories and noticing there was this thing they do where you get to like 1980 and then they're sort of there and somehow we like time warped to like 1995. I'm like, wait a minute, what's here? And what's here is this moment that I kind of came into, but it's also a moment where you have that technology changing too, but also the community is weird and different. And I think that's also time and technology because it, it is a moment of extreme whiteness for lack of a better way to put it. We know very little in terms of demographics of this period because it's sort of the height of the, when, when the most visible folks are folks who identify sort of under cross-dresser, which at the time is itself this weird big umbrella for a lot of folks who basically aren't identifying as transsexual. It's like you wanted to, um, and that's sort of how they fall. Um, so yeah, you, you get this period I'm like, well, what's there? And what's there, and part of I think why we missed it, is that stuff is starting to become digital. It's starting to become computerized. But it's, it's and then like different smaller regional groups are moving at their own pace. So this was sort of what got into the work is like knowing that all of what we have, it's that you have this weird transitional moment as increasingly stuff is being digitized, it's going online. But that means that the traditional archival methods, so the ways you do history aren't as immediately accessible. Um, it's why the fascinating stuff about cisgender, I came into it, I was at like Lavender Language and Linguistics years ago. And everyone was just like, well, where did cisgender come from? And it's like, well, there was this Wikipedia reference you used in it for a while that got pulled down that I talked about in the chapter. I'm like, well, how did that happen? And it's honestly, it is the particularities of Usenet itself. If you've never heard of Usenet, it's like you take Reddit and Twitter, you make them have a baby, but with zero moderation. And that is what you get with Usenet. Um, often use the Gene Spafford quote, describe it as a herd of elephants with um, diarrhea. And that's sort of how he, that's his joking way he describes it. Um, but we get cisgender because of all its particularities and a small set of people who are at the edge of the cross-dressing community who had this very different idea about it were able to make it really visible. And at some point it hops once you get the World Wide Web. It sort of hops off and it starts to get adopted. And then Julia Serrano really popularizes it. Um, but I think like we don't get that history without having that digital link because otherwise, if you look at the digital transgender archive, which is amazing, I'm not saying this so any shade at them, because actually you can find it now because so much of that stuff is done with OCR and word searchable. Cisgender never appears. It does not appear because it is considered like I've talked to folks who are active on used it. I'm gonna say a name, but like maybe two of you recognize, like they're like, oh yeah, that was that weird word Laura Blake used, and suddenly we're all using it. <laughs> and for them, they're just like. They're like, it was this weird thing she said. And it's because of this stuff, but we don't get that without, in this case, luckily, Usenet was archived. And there's, I can talk about why, but, but yeah, we don't get that because of that. So that's like one example of, we need both of these things, but we lose, and again, this is no shade any of those historians. It's just the reality of, as it becomes increasingly digitized, we lose that history because it's in a different format. And now it's, I'm not a historian, but it feels like, it's starting to think more seriously about okay, well, how do we fold this in? Which means like, how do we also archive that before it all vanishes? Because we cannot trust a corporation to, frankly, to give a shit about saving our history. So, like, so we got to start to do it, but we also can't hand it over to the internet archive because sometimes their approach of what I say is they, they're like, we'll hoover it up and think about the ethics later. It's like, I'm glad you saved it, but I'm also not so thrilled it is out, you know, it's just out there. Um, so I don't want to take up too much more time, but yeah, that's sort of how I think about it. like we can't get that period, those decades, without looking at these two things coming together because it changes everything. About we don't get here without there, and we don't get it without this weird like period in the middle. Yeah, yeah I, I want to oh. uh, no. go ahead. I just wanted to build on on what you were saying, Avery. A uh, part of why I wrote my book, I think of it as a bit of a capturing of a moment in Tumblr history, in YouTube web show history, where uh, there seem to be more possibilities 
And the way that we were interacting with Twitter and Blogger and some of those sites was very different. And the language that we were using at that time, people were using the language of radical women of color, people were using the language of, and, and understanding that in a way that wasn't negative or reductive and um, also involved people doing the work of educating themselves when they didn't know certain things. There, there was more conversation that seemed possible in this little web of time and we're not there anymore. I feel like Twitter has exploded into something that I don't really recognize. I mean, also we're aging as the platforms age. And so that's also changing who is on what platforms. And I think that there's been a real uh, segregation in terms of age because of how these platforms have uh, moved so that you can have young people who very earnestly find lesbian offensive. And like, there are lots of reasons why, you know, we should talk about the use of the word lesbian, but then, you know, how does that work with like older, you know, black lesbians who I think I definitely see in my legacy, even though I don't identify as lesbian. Um, but there's a way that I think we have been kind of taken away from each other uh, because of how these platforms have divided us. And I'm thinking about that in terms of transness as well. So, and, and regionally, and we were talking about this before, the move to the language of trans uh, sometimes obscures traditional genders that are not legible within a Western context. So one thing that I also look at is uh, Machi work in Suriname, which understands queerness and transness as energy and not as um, identity. And so if there's still room for folks who don't understand their sexuality or their gender as identity, but understand it as behavioral, et cetera, what do we lose when uh, the Western paradigm becomes the dominant one? Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Moya. And I'm thinking about like, your work about um, you know trans advocacy online and um, specifically for trans women of color, um, and the way that digital platforms have shifted. Like, do you think that that is still possible in the way that it was like when you were doing that research, or like? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't think it's possible in the same way. I think that the way that the web has moved has made things much less of a conversation and much more of a language and articulation to followers. Uh, people have, I've talked about this a bit with Miriam Kaba, that the move to influencers and to followers has changed the relationship structure of how people interact on the internet. And so something I talk about in my book, um, I talk about Janet Mock's work with the hashtag girls like us at length, but that is possible because we had a relationship that we built online, which is a relationship I do not think that we could build in this current iteration of Twitter. It's just too many people. It's not possible in the same way. But those early relationships, I think, really facilitated my book and, and where, um, where I was going. And I don't think that it's easy to do that now. Yeah, thank you. Um, kind of related to this, I, this question is for T and for Alex um, around um, thinking about like the ways that some of these apps that you are both studying are kind of flattening trans experiences. And um, I think both of the examples that you gave rely on these like quantitative aspects to some extent. And I'm curious if you could both reflect on like, do you think that quantification is useful or possible? I mean, it's obviously possible, but is it possible um, in helpful ways or like, are there ways to do that well or better? Or, you know, what are your thoughts? I can go first, that's fine. Um, yeah, so I think when we're thinking about quantification, I think it really, it's 
definitely beneficial. Um, like in my work, I have spoken with people who have all of their transition on a spreadsheet. You know, they have their hormones, they have like their blood work, they have everything, even like prices for like, you know, what they're looking for, everything on spreadsheets. So I think for, for these, uh, for a subset of people, definitely. Um, but I think for others, especially uh, for people who are, you know, not necessarily looking to have, you know, pursue, I guess, the same transition goals as what is, might be expected of them. Um, quantification is definitely limited. Um, I don't know if it's, you know, due to the nature of quantification itself or just the way that these apps really embed quantification into their platforms. So like maybe just, thinking about like what they want to record or like what they want to remember, what they want to have as goals might not be lined up rather than quantification of stuff. I don't know if I'm making sense. Um, but, but I think definitely quantification is something that's beneficial for a lot of people. And I would be hesitant to say, you know, just get rid of all of it. But I think coming at it with a critical eye and really thinking and challenging the paradigms and ideology behind them um, is something that we should consider. Yeah, I can share a little too. I'm gonna to try and answer this question, but also uh, have a confession to make. So I know that I presented my my little mini talk as kind of like a critique of like all these apps, but the confession is that as um, like as a doctoral student, I created one too. So like part of what I thought was that like, oh, like look at all these bad apps. Like what if like trans people could like make our own? And like, I was so excited about that possibility to the extent that like for like six years, I worked to like basically like make a discord of like a bunch of trans developers and people who are interested in voice training. And we like talked a bunch, we made an app and like, you know, did user testing and like talked to a lot of trans people and all this stuff. And what we did was we just ended up reproducing a lot of the same issues that were that are in the commercial for-profit apps and the you know free and open open source trans created apps as well that I showed you, um, which is that they kind of rely on this like quantification and segmentation of voice along various lines. And I agree with you, T, for sure that like that is wanted and needed by trans people, but we should ask why that is too. Like I think that like. For me, when I was working on this voice training app, um, I was working with people through these various Discord communities for voice training, training and also on Reddit, who are kind of filtering in as well, um, and Twitter. And they, to me, like I felt that they were interested in quantification, um, especially of um, not just pitch, but more measures. So like resonance and like that's a very complicated algorithmic problem that like even the for-profit apps don't have down yet but um these trans developers like did it and they made it um and like those people like as a lot of like other folks before like during this part were saying like those trans people are not like all trans people like they were like you know very highly like technically skilled they were um, a lot of them were white, a lot of them had like higher education. Um, and I think like, despite my like wish and like willingness to like improve upon the technologies that were existing, um, I don't think that we succeeded. Um, I think that it was really difficult to imagine designs and like um, to create something that didn't um, value the same kinds of things as the existing apps do. Um, we kind of attempted to move away from the quantification by having um, a kind of more agnostic like voice strengthening exercise that people could do that like didn't matter what their goal or like whatever it was like it didn't measure your pitch it was just like how long can you hold this note like this will help regardless of what you're trying to do and we we did work with some speech therapists who had like different opinions about like what we should do. And a lot of the voice strengthening exercises that are very common in trans circles are not the ones that are recommended by clinical speech therapists. But as an academic, I was working with both. So I had to figure out what to do. And I conceded to the academic requirements that I had to 
complete an app, I had to create an app, I had to test an app, all these things I had to do to finish my dissertation. And so like, yes, I guess having trans led platforms and having like quantification tools, like all these things could work, but it's also like, who's doing them? Why are they doing them? Who can access them? What ideas are going into them? Like all these things also matter. And um, I don't think I, my dissertation succeeded in doing that, but it may be like, it might be useful or interesting to other people. Um, it also ties into a much larger critique I have of like community-based design and participatory design. And I can talk forever about that, but I'll move on. Thank you, Alexia. Yeah, that's, I think that's something that I really love about your work is how reflective you are and how you're not scared to say like, hey, like, you know, maybe the way I approach things wasn't um, the best way to go. But like, at the same time, like, I do think you've done really important work. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, we, we're technically out of time. Um, but we start a little late on this panel. So I'm just going to try to get to at least one of the questions, the audience questions in the Q&A. Um, this is from Cassie, who asks, I would love to hear more about the lost generation that Avery mentioned in the chat and any other panelists takes on the temporality of transness, like around birth age and also the age at which we might come out or transition or start being seen socially as trans or as our gender. Um, and then there's one more um, question in the chat that um, if someone wouldn't mind typing an answer to that, that would be amazing. But um, this one, um, Avery, if you wouldn't mind starting us off to answer live. Yeah, sure. It's So that's so that comment about loss duration on note comes from I did um, ethnographic interviews in 2014 with um, some trans folks. And this was someone who was in their 30s at the time. And they were sort of talking about coming out. Um, and uh, for them, they identify as genderqueer. It's feeling they're like, I'm not really a Tumblr youth, but I'm also not one of the 50 year old folks who's gonna go on Susan's place. So where do I go? And they also talk really reflectively and amazing. I, I have an extended quote from them in the conclusion about the, the kind of thing about what is what do these message boards mean? Like, how do we think about these media differently? I think they had that particular perspective. I don't know, I'm from that generation too. I was on message boards as a small child, possibly when I was still illegal, because um, I was oh, not 13 yet. Um, but I think for me, I think about generation two, it's, I'm briefly mentioned talking about my work is this is what that chapter five is about. It's called Becoming Obsolete in Your Own Time, because it is about, that quote comes from a crossdresser a well-known one that's um, Cynthia Phillips, who ran Bolton and was one of the two people running Bolton and Park Ave San, uh, San Antonio. And in it, which he's talked about, so sort of feeling like I'm becoming obsolete compared to all these other people because she's not online. They have not, they, that entire group was incredibly skeptical of the internet. I talk in extended detail about that because for them, like we are aging out, but then they were seeing youth coming out because trans youth have always existed, you know, um, Jules Gil Peterson's work definitely absolutely gets at this, but they weren't able to talk to each other collectively until the internet in a way to like digital communications until a way that was safe. And so it allows these youth to see each other and talk to each other and be like, oh, wait, we can do this and come out at a younger age. And so you get this interesting thing of like, that also changes how we think about transness and that it isn't like this thing you come into once you're in your 30s or 40s and you're independent and you can start to go to groups, you can start to go to meetings, you can start to get the newsletter. It was like, oh, I'm already using my computer. It's already a thing in my family. I use it for school. Why don't I just look up this? Why don't I use this thing I already use? Because um, the other thing I know that's worth knowing is that trans groups, institutional trans groups had barriers to youth being involved because they were afraid that their members would get arrested. They were very seriously concerned that they would be charged with child endangerment. Um, so one example I used was a group in Arkansas that required youth who wanted to attend get notarized permission from their parents. So you just have to get written, you had to get notarized and then their parent had to be there. Otherwise they were not allowed in the meeting space. You know, so there are these barriers that are about these people who don't have a lot of power already wanting to protect themselves. And largely, these are also remember white people. You know, I like I, I always want to cast this. This is a history of whiteness. Um, but even so, they were still vulnerable. Um, so I think when we think about this temporary generation, we have to, this idea of trans youth being able to talk and connect is historically very new. 
And it's all because of the internet. Because before there were some connections, you could do it locally, you could do it in big cities, like we see in San Francisco, but you don't get it at a, at very least within English language spaces, a national level scale until the internet. It just can't, it can't happen. And that totally changes who is the face of transness and what perspectives predominate. That is why when I say cross-dressers, I say it to my students, they're like, you, what? And I'm like, these people were huge then, but you don't even think about it now. I think Mickey, um, Mickey, I, uh, I forget her last name, has, uh, she has this quote from 2018. She said it at um, the Trans History Conference at Victoria. She's like, we are like the weird forgotten stepsisters that no one wants to talk about now but they were huge for a good 20 or 30 years in the movement. And it's all about this generation change. I'll stop talking. I can keep talking. <laughs> Thank you. Um, do any of the other panelists want to weigh in on this question? Just to build, I mean, just this is exactly what I'm thinking about Avery in terms of language and who gets written out of the history and how do we build connections so that there isn't a sense that there isn't a sense of perhaps judgment that I think sometimes comes from people who use language that is understood as outdated, uh, that there needs to be more of a conversation. And that's harder to do. It's harder to build the kind of relationships that establish trust, that let you understand that somebody using a term that sounds old to you, you know, is using that in good faith. Um, and I do think that there are less opportunities for us to be in intergenerational space together as queer and trans folks because of how capitalism has siloed us and made, you know, made us compete in terms of the attention and where the money goes. So I am all for analog and digital ways of connecting that allow us to connect across across generations. Thank you so much. Um, so I'm going to start to wrap things up. Thank you all for being here today. Thank you to the panelists. Um, this chat has been amazing. I think like the combination of the chat and also the, the Twitter discourse, this has been like on its own, I think some sort of like trans technology or like, you know, um, online community. Um, and I hope that we can all in some way keep in touch. I'm sure there will be other CATS events in the future. Um, watch the CATS Twitter for a recording of this event. Um, and we're gonna see what we can do about um, also sharing the chat. Um, I think there might be some like privacy concerns. So if like you've typed things in the chat that you don't want to be shared, um, that might be a good thing to um, let us know. Um, yeah, thank you so much to Anna and to Alex and TJ um, and Cass and all of the panelists um, and um, our tech support, um, Eric. And um, yeah, this has been such an amazing day and I really appreciate you all being here. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks.